und willkommen und die Zukunft. Guten Tag, Mark. Hello, Russell. How are you? Very good, thank you. Very good. Did you enjoy? Yeah. Did you enjoy that uh, little uh, intro? I, I was I was hugely impressed. I was surprised <laughs> and impressed. And the good thing is because it's we're actually recording this in the afternoon. I was able to use Guten Tag because that's actually mm. the only German uh, <laughs> greeting I know. If we did this, done this in the evening, I wouldn't know what to say. Well, it's Guten Nacht, right? Oh, is it? <laughs> there yeah. you go. Well, yeah. <laughs> Well, next time, if we ever do another one of these, uh, then, yeah. then I'll remember it for that. Yes. Yes, people. The reason why I just did that uh, is because it's episode 45 of Tomorrow's World Audit Time. And it's uh, therefore a special because it's a multiple of five. And this special is all about the country, well, the former country of West Germany. Now, why is it about West Germany, Mark? Well, that is because on the 9th of November... It is the 35th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. Mm. The very exciting uh, event in our life. Mark, would you say that's one of the, I would, I would, the most important event in our lifetime or one of the most important events in our lifetime? Uh, I'd say one of. I'd say the fall of the Berlin Wall in my head, right? Just thinking off the top of my head now, with not, not, not thinking this through at all. Yeah. The fall of the Berlin Wall marks like the end of the Cold War and the beginning of the 90s. And 9-11 marks the end of that kind of period of optimism and uh, excitement and marks the, the, the century that we're in. I'd say those two events. Yeah, are the two, kind of, the two big ones. Yeah, the two big ones. And they, they, they um, um, begin and start a decade that is perversely has a stranglehold on quite a lot of uh, how people view things now. Yeah, they be- I think they begin with the Berlin Wall. I'm, I'm, I'm sure, they are, obviously, there are elements, you know, there are things that led up to the fall of the Berlin Wall that are possibly more important. But in terms of events, I'd say those those two, to me, are huge. Interesting that, the, obviously, the Berlin Wall one is a positive event. And yes. the September 11th is a negative event. Yes, yeah. Well, no, no, normally, think normally the end of something is normally something that is uh, not to be welcomed. So <laughs> it, it yeah. does require, you know, something size. Well, you know, nine like eleven obviously kind of changed changed politics and changed the way, you know, the the, the war and terror. Yeah, that, I don't know. I, 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 just like yeah, there's a beginning and an end, and um, there was a happy time and there was a sad time. <laughs> it was the best of worlds. It was the worst of worlds. Do you think? Do you think it's interesting that they all those dates also coincide with us probably becoming self-aware human beings at the beginning, Holy and then, fuck, and then never... adults at the end? <laughs> Yes. Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh, oh no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, how dare you, Russ? Are you trying to be sin? No, no, absolutely. And I was just, just and of course, one is 9-11 and the other is 9-11. <laughs> oh, bloody hell. Yeah. With the, you know, the European 9-11 and the American 9-11. So, you know, something to be learned there. Yes. Well, yeah, uh, yeah. So that, that once Ooh. again, pro- shale down my spine. <laughs> evidence that we should be using the European dating system rather than the American dating yes. system. Clearly, uh, absolutely. all good things happen. It's a happier system, right? It's a happier right? system, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. a happier system. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, well, Berlin Wall. Oh, actually, I was going to say, Mark, one thing hmm. I remembered while I was thinking about the Berlin Wall. In your house, when what used to pop around your house back when we were younger, yeah, there used to be a little piece of the Berlin Wall on a little pedestal. Wasn't there, it? there was indeed. Yeah, yeah. My dad got it from work. He used to work for Reuters, the uh, news agency, and they, they, they presented him that for something or another. Yeah, and I, I was, I was oh. very proud of that in the house. I don't know where it's gone actually. I haven't seen it for a while. It's should... probably lost. Oh, but yes, you should, you should we were, have yeah. route around for that. Yeah, I was always, very, I, I, I thought it was. It was lovely because it was blue and great. It had, it had the graffiti on it. It was, you know, I mean, and it wasn't like a, a three foot thick segment, you know, <laughs> with, a it big, was... with a big bus stop chopper on it. Like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, nothing like that. But it was, it was, graf- it was a real bit of the wall. It was graffiti, and it was like, and I think we got it like within, I don't know, it felt like within months of it falling. There was a bit in our house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I imagine, I imagine the, uh, you know, the, the distribution of that was pretty quick do you, do you think it's like the, the 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 true cross of jesus and and all that where, oh where I, I mean, it probably is now right than, many more pieces <laughs> than there actually the example i was thinking of was was when the was it the greenwich high street fell and a bit of it ended up in your garage <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah it's probably like the true cross of jesus, or, or the uh the tip of the spear the roman spear the, yeah. which you know yeah yeah although to be fair i did i, I, I did see when once they took apart the whole thing, it did create 1.7 million tons of rubble. 
So that's a lot. Isn't a lot. It? it does seem like there's enough to go around. Yeah, that does seem like plenty to go around, doesn't it? But the the bit you want though is the bit in the outside with the graffiti. It's not the bit of kind of concrete in the <laughs> middle, the, the unglamorous bit. Well, I do actually. I'm just thinking. I, I I presume at some point I did touch that. So that does mean yeah. So absolutely. That, so that does mean I have touched a bit the Berlin Wall, a bit of the Berlin Wall, and a piece of the moon because I've t- there's a if you go into the uh, Cape Canaveral they, you can touch a piece of the moon there's like a little oh, I didn't know there's that. a little bit of the moon on in display where you can rub your finger on it that you can touch that's exciting yeah so that's good i mean you've been to berlin though right yeah but i i didn't think look at the wall i just uh... oh okay <laughs> cuz as we said like there's 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 plenty to touch in berlin <laughs> I, I mean i got a kebab went to went to some bars uh you know mm. yeah didn't yeah didn't i didn't actually think of going to the wall <laughs> I think I think maybe okay. I, I think maybe I I in my mind I just thought well, it's not there anymore, so I didn't think of going to see it. But there are there are I now know there are like significant sections of it, aren't there? Significant sections, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like an outdoor gallery these days. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Berlin Wall facts, Mark. I thought you'd give some Berlin Wall facts. Oh, please. So it was obviously built by East Germany, the the goddamn commie uh, side of the of the equation. They they started building. They 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 got fed up basically of. All of these East Germans defecting to the West. All those, all those East Germans who were just sick of winning. Yes, yeah, 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 exactly. And, and actually, I have to say, oh, yeah. Before I go into this, I have to admit, and I want, always wonder how many people think this. Oh, yeah, I think I know what you're going to say. Go on. Until I was an adult and I was at university, yeah. and we start and we studied the Berlin Airlift. Mm-hmm. I had no idea that Berlin was entire. It was an enclave entirely surrounded yeah. by East Germany. The wall walled in West Berlin. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm pretty sure that I can't yeah. be the only person who just assumed that Berlin was in the middle, like, and mm. East and West Germany ran through it, and the wall was between East and West Germany, running down the middle. Which is what mm. I mean. That's what you would assume if you'd not looked into these things. I think. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. No. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. I, that's why I knew what you're going to say because I, yeah. I, you know, I mean, obviously, you, you do learn it, but obviously, in your head, you think like, oh, well, yeah, the wall goes down the middle because it's a border, and actually, no, no. West Berlin is this weird little island right in the heart of East Germany, basically. Yeah. So basically, yeah. So obviously, and was, they walled around it. So so West Berlin was kind of like a shortcut for the, for anybody to defect because they didn't have to go all the way over to West Germany. They could just pop into West Berlin. So so yeah, the East Germans got fed up with this. So they obviously they originally put up uh, just like a big fence, which and they they called and then but then obviously not big fence isn't good enough. So then they started building proper wall defenses and stuff like that. But do you know what they called? They actually didn't call it the Berlin Wall. They called it the anti-fascist protection rampart. I was going to say, I, I knew anti something was in there. Yeah, rampart. Oh, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That makes it sound exciting, doesn't it? Um, it does rather. But uh, mm. old uh, old Willie Brandt in the in the West, he coined the term the Wall of Shame, uh, which always just makes me think of competitive eating competitions because they always have a wall of fame and a wall <laughs> of shame, don't they? If you, if you fail to, they do. You fail to eat. But yeah, so but so before this was built, about three and a half million East Germans had defected to the West. After it was built, it was a very good wall. Really, really did a bang up job of this wall uh, because after it did, almost nobody could get across it. So about a hundred, uh, they reckon about a hundred thousand people tried to escape over that wall uh, over the years that it was in existence, and they reckon only five thousand succeeded. So you know, bang up job on the old wall building there. Like you know, great, great compliments to the to whoever yep. yeah, whoever came out that wall. Yeah, they um, they understood the assignment, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, actually, actually famously, it was actually two walls because it was it was mm. a wall. And then a, uh, a pleasant, what's, the killing zone. What's pleasantly known as the death strip. The Z strip. Yeah, that's and then yeah, another the killing wall. zone. Yeah, I think about, I think they're about it's about four, between three and a half and four meters high. I was actually surprised by how few people actually got killed though trying to cross. They reckon between one hundred and forty and two hundred people ended up getting killed crossing. Which I, I, I don't know. I think maybe I imagine that there were people getting strived with machine guns left, right, and centre as they were all running across. I but, have to say. The one thing I associate East Germany with is like incredibly good administration. I do not believe for one second they do not know exactly how many people they kill because <laughs> yeah. the amount of paperwork that had to be completed. Yeah, I think I think possibly it's like the the East Germany says one hundred and forty and West Germany says two hundred. Oh, okay, that, that makes sense. That okay. kind of disagreement. Well, you say one hundred and forty, but we're missing another sixty people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Part the fences of the wall there was. Um, it had like on the top of it was like a big smooth pipe that like meant to stop you being able to mm. get over it. And then there was mesh fencing, anti-vehicle trenches, barbed wire, a loads of dogs on long leashes, beds of nails, which they which they nicknamed Stalin's carpet. And then uh, there was three hundred and two watchtowers and twenty bunkers full of guards. 
So, you know, you're really, really making sure that they did a good job there. No, no lasers, though. It's a shame they didn't, <laughs> oh, yeah, didn't cover the area of laser. <laughs> the successful people to cross it did so by various ways. There was um, a few got out through the, there used to be sewers running underneath it. So they did the old, Buffy always used to go places under sewers, didn't oh, she? Yeah, the, yeah. And then obviously the, the Germans got wise to that, so they got rid of the sewers and the people dig, dug tunnels. A few hot air balloon attempts uh, did it. And it, one guy, I think the best one I uh, read about is that some fellas got a low slung sports car and then we, and then weakened the 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 roof and windscreen on it like kind of like probably a Hollywood stuntman would do yeah. in a James Bond film. So it'd rip off and then just drove it flat out at the at the barrier and uh, a duct <laughs> and it just did it ripped, it ripped the roof and windscreen off and the rest of the car just zoomed through the through zoomed through the border and they got weight got through that is ballsy <laughs> if that doesn't work that doesn't work in a spectacular way yeah, right yeah. that is wow that worked yeah that's amazing yeah yeah i suppose you'd be quite shocked wouldn't you <laughs> yeah yeah totally god well yeah. yeah after after that the uh the these germans um made sure that the road wasn't straight <laughs> I mean, so that makes, which also makes sense yeah, right yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I was surprised that anybody in East Germany had a had a, a long, long oh, sports yeah. car. I thought they only drove Trabants over there, but mm. maybe it was a Trabant sports car. I don't know. But yeah, the last the, the last person to be killed by board guards was on the sixth of February, nineteen eighty nine. It's a bit unlucky, isn't it? Uh, yeah. And the yeah, last person to just last. to die attempting to get across was the eighth of March, nineteen eighty nine, when his balloon crashed and he he, he he died that way. But yeah, there obviously had been a few famous people played music around the the Berlin Wall. <laughs> You had, uh, in 1987, you had uh, David Bowie play the wall mm. in, in West Berlin, but deliberately really close to the wall so that East Berliners could hear him. And they all, they all crowded around East Berlin and then a big riot broke out. Uh, and then um, in 1988, uh, Bruce Springsteen actually played in East Berlin. But then obviously most famously, Mark, and you know what I'm going to say yeah, here. I do know. I think, you've been waiting to say this for weeks. Go on. <laughs> most famously, uh, the obviously the, the greatest pop star, rock star of modern times, uh, Mr. David Hasselhoff, played on top of the wall. And actually, I didn't realise this. I, I got this wrong. I always assumed that he played on top of the Berlin Wall on the night that it fell, but he didn't. It was on New Year's Eve following. So it was actually, ah, so it was actually a month, month, and, month and, a and a half later, or so yeah. later. But I, I thought I'd remind myself of this performance, and I watched it, and I saw something which I've never seen before, Mark, which oh, I want to show okay. you. Okay. So I've got the, I've got. So yeah, everybody go on YouTube and look this up. And the reason I spotted this is because you know YouTube does a thing now where it shows you a little graph of where yes. people are most most pop- people watch, and there's yeah. a sudden spike towards the end, around three I can see it. three minutes and ten seconds, something like that. Yeah. So watch <laughs> watch what happens. Look above David's head. Oh, look above David's head. Okay. <laughs> Did you see that? What was that? Somebody throws a lit firework, and the only reason I- it doesn't hit Hasselhoff square in the head is because he happens to be he, bend- he happens to be bending down to address the crowd. Yeah. I've never seen that before. That was actually quite. Like, uh, I, that took me aback. Like, <laughs> it was right at the camera almost. Yeah. yeah. If the Hoff hadn't just hadn't at that very moment randomly decided to bend down to address the crowd, he would have been hit square in the face with a massive firework. Wow! And it could, I assume, Mark, that would have just immediately restarted the Cold War. Yes, absolutely. The war would have gone straight. American blood being spilled <laughs> on the, German soil. The war would have gone straight back up. Tanks would have rolled in. Yeah. Shocking, imagine how like, what a difference would have made to the to history, Mark. Mr. President, somebody's hassled the <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I, re- I recommend anybody, um, everybody, go and look at that on YouTube. Anyway, I, but I, I I really enjoyed that performance. I, I, I think I, you have to have a heart stone not to enjoy everyone enjoying themselves with Hasselhoff with his p- piano key scarf. I'd love one of yeah, those piano key yeah. scarves and his and his flashing jacket. That seems achievable. The, the piano key scarf seems like something you can get. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, it'd be a great sort of fancy dress costume, wouldn't it? Oh, it goes Hasselhoff from <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. New Year's like, Eve, nineteen eighty nine, eight ninety. Fill your pockets with like bits of uh, bits of concrete and hand, <laughs> rubble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hand about people. Yeah, oh, yeah. That's an idea for anybody. Anybody at home wants to do that? I'll, I'll let you do that. Um, yeah. Anyway, so yeah, obviously the fall of the Berlin Wall, Mark. Mm. Turns out I know very little about the Berlin Wall and and events surrounding it, because I didn't know anything about this. So the reason it came about was a thing called the Pan-European Picnic. Do you know about this? 
No, actually, no. I'm, no, I don't. What's the pan-European picnic? So the actual thing, the, 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 the straw that broke the Iron Curtain's curtain rail is, the, uh, <laughs> is this thing called pan-European picnic. So what happened was in, on the 19th of August 1989, so a few months before this, the Hungarian and the Austrian governments, of course they share a border, mm. they went, they, they got together and they, uh, with, and peace processes and stuff. And, th- and they said, well, I wonder what's going to happen. I wonder what Gorbachev would do if we just open the border between Hungary and Austria. What's he going to do? Is he going to, is he going to wrap badly or what, should we just test it? Yeah. So they did. They just opened the border between the two places, the two two points. And Russia did absolutely nothing. They, they, they didn't react at all. So at this point, this now means that there's an open border between, through going through the Iron Curtain essentially. And, but what that actually did was now suddenly everyone in East Germany and East Berlin legged it are them. now <laughs> absolutely yeah. legging it down to, to Hungary to get across the, to get across the border. And this created this massive sort of um, pressure on the East German borders. And the East German authorities sort of actually reacted surprisingly sort of well to this in, in terms of like sensibly. And they went, oh, we're not going to be able to stop this happening now. This is, this is just, they're all, going, they're all pouring through Czechoslovakia and down into Hungary and, and getting away. So, we, so we're going to have to draft some sort of new, new law or something to, to, to just allow them to get, to, to not do that so they can just they can just go more easily because clearly this is not anything we can ever stop anymore so what so they drafted this law that is going to, that's going to say that okay you can now pass to west west germany if you want uh, we're not going to stop you anymore and all this and then there was on the 9th of november there was this east german fella who was holding a press conference with the western press called mm. uh, gunter skabowski do you know about this and he's, he's he, I, I, I've seen this. Yeah, yeah, he's brief. He's briefing the the Western press, and he's just before this press conference. He's been given this briefing yeah. note telling him that this new law is going to be introduced to to relieve pressure on on the borders and stuff like that. And he just assumes because he's an old commie, he just assumes that he can like this is now the law, and the press will be told what to say anyway. So it doesn't really matter what he's saying in this press conference. So he just reads it out to, to the Western, all the Western journalists and <laughs> their jaws drop to the floor because he's essentially saying the Berlin Wall, there's no reason for the Berlin Wall to exist anymore. And, and they, and they double check with him and he just reads a note out. He just goes, yeah, the note says this. Yeah, I, I've seen this. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. I did not know this came from a picnic though. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And so, and so that, obviously that night, all the West German news and everybody all report this this revelation that, that East Germany is now opening its borders, and because everybody in East Germany watches West German news, they they just all immediately peg it for, for the Berlin Wall. So this announcement was made at six p.m. that night, and you know by the end of the night, everyone's legging it to, to, towards the borders, and all the guards, obviously no no guard is going to want to be responsible for mass murder of, mm. so they just they just let them all through, and that was it. Boom, gone. Iron curtain Done. down. Communism. Yeah comes to an end but it's quite funny that these things are initiated by a bunch of people uh just testing something like going originally going well oh, should, should we just see what happens if we just <laughs> ignore orders and then somebody who thinks he's following orders comically getting mixing something up and then just having to go along with it yeah it's good it's a good story that I, the, thing, the thing that's surprising most is it's hungary that does this because like obviously the the 56 hungarian uprising was absolutely smashed by Soviet forces. So the fact that they were the ones, like, you know, you, you think like Hungary and Czechoslovakia would be the two countries where they'd be a bit more like, well, we tried this before and it didn't work. Yeah. So that's not true. Let's, let, let someone else can have a go. That's incredible. Yeah. It's a reminder how think quickly things that just seem natural just disintegrate. Yeah. Yeah. I can't imagine the current uh, Hungarian leader. Uh, no. Uh, what's his name? I've got his name now. Orban. Orban. Victor Orban. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. One thing I thought was interesting, like, it was the reac- reactions to this. So, Thatcher and Mitterrand were absolutely uh, against it because they're they're of, of the of the vintage that they don't trust the Germans. So they liked they they liked Germany being split in two because yeah. they thought of re, a reunited Germany would be too powerful and would would, uh, would try and take over Europe again. So they were they, yeah. so they were full square against the Berlin Wall falling, which I thought was uh, very interesting. And there was a poll done uh, in twenty nineteen, but and they found that eight percent of Berliners still wish the wall was there. <laughs> oh, interesting! <laughs> Just big well, what, what, big wall fans. I don't know. Like. One of my favourite words is uh, "ustalgia," which is um, it's a German word and it means nostalgia for the East. 
And it is that kind of feeling of like, oh, things were simpler. Obviously, is it good by Lennon? You know, the oh, yes. Where, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like yeah. where, like, actually things were simpler. They were nice. I mean, they're doing that to protect their mum who has dementia or whatever. But, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Ustalgia. Ustalgia. You know, things were simpler. Yeah, which is a good word. And a lovely portmanteau. Yeah, it's interesting because 35, 35 years. Yeah, it's, it's peculiar thinking about stuff that's happened in our lifetime and it being 35 years ago. Because it feels like, oh, it's still, still still quite new, isn't it? still quite new. And yet it's not really. I mean, what, what happened 35 years before we were born? Something ancient for us. That's what happened 35 years ago. Something, <laughs> what would it be? something it would in the midst of time. It would have been 1956. So uh, Elvis probably recorded his first record or something like that. But 50, 55 for me. But yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we're pre-rock and roll being popular, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, that, yeah, that's yeah, how, yeah. That's how long ago that was. <laughs> Whereas the fall of the Berlin Wall only happened yesterday. And of course, like, the, the, you know, you, you look at kind of analysis of kind of votes in, in German federal elections, and you can still see the dividing line between East and West. Yeah. And it is astonishing. And things like, you know, poverty levels are different. You know, they, they, Germany reunited, but it hasn't actually kind of healed all the wounds that that division caused. So, you know, even things like, you know, AFD are far more popular in East Germany than they are in West Germany. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's quite, it's, you know, and it's it's as stark and obvious as like you draw a line across Germany where the war went and you can see the difference in voting patterns and life expectancy and, you know, 35 years, a generation has passed and still there is that kind of sense that lots of East Germans don't feel like they've been brought up to the level that they were promised. Yeah. And then also, I also think, I think Germany's also got a double one because I also think the Bavarians don't like the Northerners as well. So, like, oh, I mean, there is, I mean, yeah. <laughs> so there's, 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 there's got the, North, South, and East, West divide. The, there's an inherent divide, <laughs> as in all countries. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, you know, I mean, you know, the Italians obviously are the same as well. Yeah. But yeah, they Germany are unique in that they have this East, West one as well as a North, South. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so, Mark, shall we engage mm. in our own Unstalgia and uh, <gasps> let's do start it, Russ. The episode. Yeah. Obviously, I love all of your credit breakdowns. They are the the highlight of any episode. But I have to say, I particularly love the ones from these 1970s special episodes because they're they're, they're an absolute wealth of imagery and local colour, aren't they? Uh, A torrent of... um, Yeah, I mean, I I very much like the the Habitat special from Vancouver, which is around this time as well. 76, maybe? This very much feels like the BBC realized they had oh we've got about four and a half hours to film an opening credit special and they just went around and filmed weirdos on the street <laughs> along with a couple of buildings they i think i don't know how many bullet points there are one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven eleven so the credits are what like 20 seconds long i have 11 <laughs> bullet points and within two of those bullet points there are at least four or five like they absolutely rammed this opening <laughs> credits with as many things as they could let's start then classic you know classic theme tune it's over the following images so uh keep along everyone or skip 15 minutes ahead and i'm sure i'll have finished uh we crash zoom at the bmw headquarters to find the camera crew filming on a bridge overlooking an autobahn we have four then very quick shots of the hq campus all filmed from ground level the last of which has the munich tv tower in the background we'll come back to that We then get exterior shots involving beer, all taken voyeuristically from a long distance. We have a woman carrying fistfuls of stein. There's a lad in a striped shirt lifting a stein to his mouth in his left hand, which is unusual, Russ. Chance of catching a left-handed stein user is slim. A southpaw. (laughs) A southpaw. Sinister. Harry Styles is having having to use two hands to lift his stein to his mouth. (laughs) And then we have a rockabilly man swilling beer round his cheeks and that rockabilly man he looks rather unglamorous unfortunately his shot does end with a lovely match cut as the final beer swigger makes a face kind of <laughs> cheeks out i love that, I, lo- to... I love the like you've, you've put photos on the on the dock of that and you've captured those two moments and Thank it's, a, it's much, a yeah. perfect it's an absolutely perfect uh, little match it's brilliant isn't it they must have pissed themselves yeah, laughing yeah, when they knew yeah, they could do yeah, this yeah yeah because it cuts to uh, um, uh, a close-up of a kind of a grotesque figure on a statue uh, uh, on a fountain uh, uh, spissing out a stream of water. <laughs> and we follow that stream down 
And then we have the logo, the Tomorrow's World logo, and uh, superimposed over the shot that's been taken from the front of a car traveling along the autobahn. The destination is Hamburg, apparently. We zoom into uh, the two towers of the Munich Cathedral from ground level through a bunch of kind of kind of fun 60s, 70s streetlights. I quite enjoyed those. Uh, and then we have a match cut as we zoom out from a wide shot of the TV tower and the Olympic Stadium. And then we finish with a montage of scenes from the street. We see uh, three women in chairs and the one on the right is in a kind of a classic kind of housefrau style outfit and she's uh, drifting off in the sleep because <laughs> she's in this little beam of sunlight. We see a creepy chap in leather hose, later hose and walking through the street with some kind of case attached to his waist. Couldn't work that out. He looked like some kind of horrible street performer. <laughs> There was a purple hatted lady viewed from behind a hedge. <laughs> uh, there was a waiter who looked a little bit like Gordon Burns, uh, happily chatting to a sitting customer. And that sitting customer is wearing a classic Bavarian cap with a feather. Yeah. Uh, and then we have a small boy or a tiny man in lederhosen and yellow shirt and socks trying but failing to hold back either his parents or two giants. <laughs> and then and then we have, from West Germany, superimposed a wide shot of the clockwork mechanism on the front of uh, Munich Aroust House, the town hall. And then the camera finally zooms out, pans down and to the right to reveal a besuited Willy Woolly ready to present the show to us, Russ. <laughs> splendid, Mark, splendid. And I have to say, it's one of those things where they you, you watch that and you go, my God, they've really gone out of their way to pack this to the rafters with stereotypes. Mm. Yeah. But, um, I mean, I've been to Munich several times, Mark. I've been to October, Oktoberfest uh, about four years or five years on the trot. And, obviously, we went on your stag do to Munich. We did, didn't yeah. We? And we did. I have to say, oh, it, one of the things I do like about Munich is they really embrace their stereotypes. They, they really embrace Yeah, they? they love the Munich of it all, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. you you will see plenty of people walking around in lederhosen and uh, with feathers in their caps and, and yep. drinking large uh, masses of beer and and all of this uh, stuff. So, so I actually don't think it was. It was. I doubt the camera crew had very much nope. trouble seeking this stuff out. I think it was all there for for them to see on display. There are more montage shots later on where they have captured a whole different bunch of people all wearing stereotypical outfits. <laughs> yeah. I, they did not apparently they were tripping over the streets into these people's laps. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I, and as you said, like we've been to Munich, I've been a couple of times, you've been a few times, and yeah, people just genuinely seem to walk around looking like they're from Bavaria. Bavaria. Yeah, yeah. I wonder what they made of uh, you going around in your inflatable uh, dinosaur outfit, Mark. <laughs> I would not accept judgment from anyone in that country with the clothes that they wear, Russ. How dare they? I did check a couple of things about Munich before we get into the program proper. I always wondered why we call it Munich, which it, which already sounds like a German word. Yeah. But when you go over there, they, they all call it München. Yeah. And it turns out it's because it used, actually used to be called Munich or Munichen or Munichen which yep. meant where the monks are from or something like that. Oh, okay. And it was just the English took the first half of the word, the Munich part of it, and started calling yep. it that. And the Germans just got rid of the I, so they just called it München, like that. And that's why oh. That's why we call it two different things. It's actually from the same word. That's interesting. But while I was looking at that, do you know who, what it's Russell, I feel, I feel dangerously close to learning something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I... The thing that stuck out to me is, do you know what the Italians call Munich? No. Monaco. No. Yes. No, I didn't know that. That's yeah, mad. yeah. I've just realised I've not checked what the Italians call Monaco because <laughs> that was my exact next hang question. On, so what do they on, call Monaco? Hang on, I need to check that. That's going to drive me mad all episodes. Otherwise, oh well, just think of the fun it'll drive people listening there, Russ. If you don't look it up, <laughs> oh, it's also called Monaco. Oh, there you go. How do they differentiate? Because they can drive to both. Well, that's. I mean, that must be. No wonder they have to build so many sports cars. They're always going to the wrong place and have to have to uh, get to the other place in a hurry. That's Madness. It? Yeah, oh, yeah, 100%. Yeah, I do now. <laughs> and three famous people born in Munich. Jerry Ryan, who played Seven of Nine in Star Trek. Mm. Harold Faltermeyer, composer of one of the greatest pieces mm. of music of all time. Mm. Mm -hmm. And Richard Strauss, a composer you may have heard of, Mark, mm. who has contributed to the films of a certain... <laughs> <laughs> director that we Un unnameable unmentionable director you right? may get mentioned later in this episode no. but anyway talking to music shall we get on to willy willy's introduction and the first piece yes do
Munich, deep in the heart of Bavaria in southern Germany, has long had a reputation as a gay and hospitable city. But now it has all the signs of being a very affluent one as well. Everybody seems to be driving a new car, the shops are full of good and expensive things to buy, and the cafes and restaurants are crowded with people obviously able to pay for the pleasure of eating out. And it's been the same wherever we've been in Germany, from Hamburg to Frankfurt, Hanover to Karlsruhe. A reflection of Germany's quite remarkable economic boom that's now been sustained for 15 to 20 years. But it shouldn't be assumed that it's all hard work here. Leisure and pleasure are a very important part of the scene. The average German has six to seven weeks holiday a year, including public holidays. And no public holiday is complete without music of some sort, either popular or classical. In fact, music is taken so seriously here that a group of scientists at the famous Max Planck Institute in Dortmund are concerned that young musicians should keep it in its right perspective. These students all hope to become professional musicians, to be more than just average. Whether they become concert soloists or just another member of an orchestra depends on a wide range of factors, but one is their hands. Even a minor injury can wreck a musical career. But even perfectly normal hands may be handicapped in a more subtle way. Certain hands, it appears, are musically useless. Musicians have traditionally been loath to let scientists study the problem. But now a musician turned scientist has broken the spell. He's Dr. Christopher Wagner, a name not entirely without musical association. He's invented a battery of strange machines to measure the physical limitations to musical performance. Helmut Muller hopes to become a first-class concert pianist, but he needs more than a good ear. His fingers must be able to move extremely quickly. Speed requires supple fingers, and suppleness is what this machine is designed to measure. Helmut is fully aware that his future may well depend on the result of this test. The tendons of the hand and fingers differ from person to person. With this instrument, by releasing a catch, Dr. Wagner exerts pressure on a bar which lifts the fingers. The more the fingers are moved, the more supple they are. 49 degrees, better than average. But to assess the implications of that measurement, he has to refer to his tables. He's tested several hundred pianists. This is the chart of a very famous pianist. All the values peak at the right-hand side of the chart, which indicates that all the fingers are extremely supple. But the adjacent charts belong to a mediocre performer. The suppleness values are poor. Suppleness is critical. Size, surprisingly, isn't. These are the right hands of two major international pianists. For the aspiring concert violinist, a critical factor is the flexibility of the wrist. If the wrist is too stiff, the musician can't produce all the notes without discomfort. This not only destroys his confidence, but it leads to inferior techniques and style. He'll never make the grade. This ungainly machine can put a measure on a violinist's future. The forearm must be firmly secured so that it measures only the twisting of the wrist and the hand. Emil, too, is understandably anxious. If his wrist is too stiff, no known training or therapy can loosen it. 46 is low, perfectly adequate for most of us, but hopeless for a dedicated violinist. Emil has to decide whether to continue with his musical career, a decision which Dr. Wagner himself had to make when he gave up music for physiology. Dr. Wagner had his own hands measured, they turned out to be incredibly stiff. Remembering his own past failures, he hopes to save many young musicians the same anguish. Favourite German stroke Austrian musician, musical figure, Mark? Oh, uh, well, I, I see we would talk about him at some point, but for me, it is actually Richard Wagner. Oh, really? Really? More than... Yeah, yeah, I, I do love his operas, yeah. More than, uh, more than... More than Mozart? Yes. 
Really? Oh yeah, I, I like I've I've seen a couple of Mozart operas and I they're fun, but for me they're too twee. Right. I quite like the kind of oppressive darkness of uh, Wagner's operas, particularly Ten Hauser and um, Tristan Isolde. And I'm hoping to go see Die Valkyrie next year. So Ooh. yeah, it would be it would be of, of that ilk. It would be Wagner. Oh, not even not, Who, not, not even Beethoven getting a shout in there. You asked my favourite, Russ. You didn't ask me to, <laughs> well, to just well, zero well, you were sum. Very, you were very quick. You were very quick. Mark. Oh yeah, yeah, because that's yeah, yeah, because uh, because that's yeah, because I, I really enjoy Wagner operas. M- most of them, not all of them. I think my, mine's either mine's either Mozart or Nana, uh, singer of Ninety Nine Rebellions. Oh, I mean that's a good shout. Yeah, yeah. not Falco. Ooh, ooh, he's Austrian. Yeah, he? yeah. he was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, though he is more of a one-hit wonder, though is he less of a one-hit wonder than Nana? I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I, I, I've um, uh, the last seven and a half minutes of of Tristan Isolde are, are some of the most incredible and wonderful moments in art, and so that 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 takes a lot of shifting for me. Uh, yeah. The fact that and Wagner is a, a all... virulent anti-Semite. Yeah, I say, you fully agree with all of his political views as well. As so yes. you were telling, so you were telling me off off air. Yeah, off air. <laughs> uh, briefly about Mozart, Mark, because uh, obviously yeah. this this piece has this once again. This is an episode with only one piece of music in it. Yeah, cracking piece of music. Obviously, it's Eine kleine Nacht music. Yeah, uh, by Mozart. Um, I didn't realize you make, you make German sound so romantic. <laughs> I don't know how you do it. <laughs> well, I'm I'm putting the effort in, Mark, because um, as you know, my my girlfriend is half German, and uh, and her father is from Bavaria, and he has been known to listen to this episode. So, <gasps> oh my to, god! To this podcast. So so hello, Wolfgang, if you're listening. Uh, I hope my pronunciations are absolutely bang on. Uh, there's, a, I, I, there's a tear forming in his eye of pride, no doubt. <laughs> just how beautiful yeah, yeah. you are mangling his language. Yes, yeah, yeah. This that piece of music was composed when Mozart was a, a mere thirty-one. Although he died when he was thirty-five, so I mean, by, in his terms, that's actually quite late in life, I guess. Uh, but in 1787. But what I didn't realise is that it, well, he didn't release it. He just wrote it down in a, on his on his notepad or whatever. And it was only published in 1827, like long, oh, wow. 30, 35 years after he died. So it, it only became famous like posthumously. And then, obviously, once it got did get released, uh, everyone went, "That's a cracking piece of music. I, I, we can go busking with that and such like." I, I look obviously looked it up the. Played it on on YouTube. I did enjoy a couple mm. of a couple of YouTube. Video- I have to say the comments under classical music on YouTube are surprisingly funny. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, the one one that stood out to me was um, "Yo, when are you dropping the Beethoven diss track?" <laughs> <laughs> to, to, to which somebody had replied underneath, "What's the point, dude? Beethoven is deaf." <laughs> 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 That's quite funny. But then the other the other thing that I didn't realise is that 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 piece of music has got four movements, and mm-hmm. the fourth movement I also knew, and I didn't know that was also Anna Klein and music. It's the it's this. It's do you recognise this? Hang on. Oh, I mean yes, obviously, and this is also from Anna Kleiner. Enough. So that's the last movement of Einar Klein and music. And I didn't know they were two connected pieces of music. That was, of course, no. I then I was immediately going, what the hell? Why do I know that so? And it's, it's the theme tune to Brain of Britain on Radio 4. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> yeah, which uh, the most I think the most unfair of all quiz programs. I don't, have you ever listened to Brain of Britain? Uh, not for like 20 years or something. <laughs> was that Robert Robinson as well? Robert... That was Robert yeah, Robinson. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And so the way it worked was they were sitting in a row and the first person gets asked the question, and if the, and if they know it, they say the answer. If they don't know it, it goes to the next person along. And if they don't know it, it goes to the next person along, right? So that means if you're if you're sat next to a real brain box, you you're going to get the... fewer questions. And if you're sitting next to an idiot, you're going to get loads of bonus questions. Mm. There it is. I, I used to that annoyed that annoyed me from a very early I age. Don't, <laughs> I don't remember, but I don't think that doesn't seem fair. No, not at all. And yet people persist in going on. Yeah, yeah. Ba ba ba. <laughs> look, look that it was so fair indeed, Mister Cook. <laughs> this is our first. This is our first piece after um, one yes. of Willy Woolly's classic. Uh, sort can, of can we discuss that? Intros. Because I think there's 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 a lot to unpack in it. Because yes. I think this is a really interesting episode. There's a lot that it, it there's there's only about four segments, yeah. and a lot of them are way way too long. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And really don't have a huge amount of content. So I was sitting down earlier having breakfast, and I was thinking like, oh, and I was thinking about two things. One which comes up in I can't even remember now. Oh, it's the third item, 
And it's and it was based a comment that you put in the notes, and it was a comment that matched something I put in as well. I was like, there's actually not a huge amount of content in this episode. So weirdly, a lot of Willy Woolly's presentation, I feel, now that I've seen this a few times, is gaslighting us into believe there are problems that simply don't exist. <laughs> To allow them to show segments to solve the problems that simply don't exist. And by gaslighting, I mean, like, he literally describes things that are not an issue or a problem yeah. or a concern, but in a manner that makes you go like, oh, I suppose I hadn't really thought about it that way, but now that I have, it's like, yeah, maybe maybe, maybe phone numbers in a different person are difficult to remember. <laughs> Uh, but the other thing is that they're obviously very impressed with West Germany. And, you know, there's a lot of very happy, smart, well, there's also a lot of very miserable looking Germans in there who, who I no doubt their hearts are full of song and, and love and laughter, but they just happen to look miserable. The other thing about this episode is that there is a barely disguised resentment that I think undercuts the whole thing. And I think it starts with Willy Woolley's introduction. When he talks about, I mean, you, you highlighted, he talks about, you know, uh, Munich being a gay and hospitable city and he talked blah, 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 and all these positive things. But then he lists benefits that German people seem to have now, now that the country has enjoyed a 15 to 20 year economic boom, which I think begs the question as to what the hell is happening in Britain. <laughs> because the, the benefits of the German people or the evidence of the benefits are that everyone seems to be driving a new car. Shops are full of good and expensive things mm -hmm. to buy, though he doesn't explain whether they're good things and expensive things yeah, or whether yeah. there are good and expensive things. Yeah. Uh, but nonetheless, they are good and expensive. And obviously that means people have money. Cafes and restaurants are crowded with people obviously able to pay for the pleasure of eating <laughs> out. No dining and dashing in, uh, in, in West Germany. And it really feels like, especially like the, the, the way he kind of, you know, emphasized 15 to 20 year economic boom. <laughs> I think, I think, you know, there is, there is a lot about this episode that I feel like tacitly you're supposed to understand. Or I think there's something later on where I even just write down is like the implication is, is how on earth have they done better than we have? <laughs> yeah. 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 Am I right? And yeah. that, that seems to be the undercurrent without, yeah. without saying anything explicit, there yeah. seems to be a sense of, why are they happier and richer than we We're are? We're the ones that won. <laughs> yeah, I don't understand. This isn't fair. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but anyway, so, so, so I just thought that was really interesting. But then I also just really, and, and, and I don't know whether it was deliberate or snide or just like accidental, but he does talk about like, oh, you know, it's not all, you know, <laughs> it's not all work, 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 and <laughs> which obviously then made me immediately watch that NatWest ad <laughs> yeah. from 1991, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, I, which I hyperlinked yeah. in, in this document so that we could share it and enjoy it together. <laughs> so all work, work, work. Um, and then he goes on to talk about how much leisure time they have, et cetera, et cetera. But the thing, the thing that amused me, because we're, we're about, he segues into this, this piece then, which is about torturing musicians. And he says... Um, uh, music is taken so seriously here that a group of scientists at the famous Max Planck Institute in Dortmund are concerned that young musicians should keep it in its right perspective. So even the example of fun and leisure yeah. is ladled with the sense that it must be taken seriously. <laughs> there will be some kind of objective measurement as to how good you could possibly become. And if you fail to meet that <laughs> measurement, you give up. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, I think. Uh, he may he may there have just stumbled across why they were they're doing much better than I, I, exactly <laughs> correct right i mean i mean willie willie himself could come could, could quite conceivably be a german couldn't he really do you think a german look about him germanic oh I aryan suppose he, teutonic <laughs> don't say aryan teutonic yeah teutonic. yeah teutonic yeah and of course it, willie you know yeah 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 that's a, though i've always assumed uh willie brandt was wilhelm brandt but i've no evidence of that i've not looked it up no yeah the max planck Institute, Mark. And did you enjoy my joke? I have to say, did you enjoy my joke? <laughs> so, so obviously these are like classical musicians they're studying at the Max Planck yeah. Institute here. So, does that mean if you if they want to study electrical guitar electric guitarists, they have to they have to go to the the Max Planck Spanking Institute? <laughs> I um I did enjoy it, Russ, but not as much as I knew you did. <laughs> yeah, I was really pleased with that. Yeah, I, I just really like the term plank spanking. Like, yeah, when, when sort of talking about guitarists, I think it's a good I think it's a good term. Well, I mean this this whole thing is 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 available for any kind of um, abuse, isn't it? This whole segment. So the, obviously, as we were watching it, I was thinking like, oh. I bet you Ross doesn't have to uh, worry about you know having too <laughs> wrists too uh, too tight a uh, uh, wrist for his uh, for 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 a penis. 
Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. The the, the 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 closeness of penis and penis is is a is a wealth of uh, hilarity, isn't it, Mark? Mm. I don't think it's uh, used enough, really. No, <laughs> Under, underutilized, right? <laughs> yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a great double entendre. It isn't is 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 wildly underused. So yeah, people at home, I recommend you using it a bit more when you. It's a it's a better homonym than um, homophone rather than um, in the last episode. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> barley and barley. I'm still not over that. <laughs> Furious for weeks, but uh, yeah, Max uh, Max Planck, obviously German theoretical physicist, uh, and he was the person that came up with with quantum theory. So basically, you know, one of the founding fathers of modern physics. But he, because he was such a big big name back in the day, and he uh, he, they had this thing called the Kaiser Wilhelm Society, mm. and they thought we can't really call, still call it Kaiser Wilhelm Society these days. So they renamed it the Max Planck Society in his honour because he went to it. And then the Max Planck Society started all of these institutes. And there's loads of them, Mark. There's 86 different Max Planck institutes. Ooh, and they study, they study everything. Like they study basically any, any sort of basic thing, any science or humanity or anything like that. There's a Max Planck Institute that studies it. And uh, they do loads and loads of research. They've got like 17,000 scientists work, work for all the various ones. They've won 39 Nobel Prizes between them, including Einstein, because he was at one of them. And yeah, they're mostly across uh, Germany. And they're the second most important research organization after uh, Harvard. And this one is in Dortmund, which I looked mm. it up. There's only one in Dortmund. And weirdly, it's the Max Planck Institute of Molecular Physiology. So I guess it's the physiology bell part of that that, 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 that Must be. fits him in to this. But yeah, we've got Christopher Wagner here, and Christopher Wagner is a. I was I was thinking he would probably get on well with Michael Rod because he's 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 made out to be a failed musician, isn't he? A, a, a fr- yeah, frustrated and failed musician uh, who's trying to who has decided to torture other musicians, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The claim is that he's he's. I think he's, I think the idea is that he wants to stop them, you know, wasting their lives pursuing music. <laughs> yeah, where, that's not what this they're not is. physically able to. But then, yeah, like the the, the torture equipment that he's using on them. Uh, I think he's just actually trying to nobble the poor... Yeah, poor 100% fellas. correct, like, yeah. yeah. If I can't do it, no one will. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The first lad, uh, Helmut Muller, is the pianist. Christopher Wagner decides to test the suppleness of his fingers by strapping them into this device and then bending his fingers back impossibly far, which which apparently still isn't far enough for him to be a, for him to be a concert pianist. It's only, it's, it's only 46. <laughs> But it looks like he's going to snap his fingers clean off yeah. from, from the angle yeah. we're looking at it. Yeah. What, why would why would anybody need to bend their fingers that much while playing the piano unless you're playing it from a from a? From, I don't think you do, top. Russ. I th- I think there's an element of gatekeeping to this, right? This, yeah. this is this is the whole nobbling, not necessarily physical, but like psychological nobbling, right? Oh, if only you were 47. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Well, I was yeah. suggests that. They test their hand or their wrist or whatever it is that they needs to be tested for their instrument. And if it's not the right reading, that's it. Yeah, nothing can be done about it. If you go online, if you go online now, there are pages after pages of, of sort of advice for pianists on how to exercising your hands and stuff. Hand yeah. exercises, wrist make exercises, on how yeah. to make them much more supple, yeah. improve flexibility and strength, and all of these things that that these, a musician would need. So that doesn't come into it at all. Had, had, no, had no, it, had no one thought of that then, or is it just? No, but, the, it, but it, maybe it's a new thing. But as you say, though, like we are explicitly told that no amount, there are no known <laughs> ways of increasing the suppleness of the wrist for that violinist. So he better bloody well hit the standard, otherwise yeah. that's it. Yeah, that, we are told that explicitly. Even though in my head I was thinking like that doesn't sound right. No, that's like I mean that's like saying you know Arnold Schwarzenegger couldn't have become Mister Universe because. He wasn't born absolutely covered in muscles, surely. Uh, yeah. Okay, that's an interesting example. But yeah, I, I, I do get what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because, he, you know, he, yeah, he wasn't born like that. And he had to put the work in. Yeah. Is there like a little bit of a little bit of sort of junior eugenics in that? <laughs> well, I didn't want to say that. I mean, I suppose I, I'm, I'm almost disappointed with myself. There's definitely times when you watch some episodes of this and you are trying to work back the age of someone and thinking how old were you about 20 years ago <laughs> and what were you doing dr wagner <laughs> you know, 20 years as it is i think he's too young but i mean it's um yeah it's it's really 
weird. It does have that kind of uh, eugenics is the kind of yeah. I don't like that strong, but that sort of that I sense, do... that sort of like skull me- measuring sort of yeah. <laughs> do you know what? Funny enough, I didn't put it in the notes, but when I first saw this, because you see a close up of two hands, two faces, I did think of phrenology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. was thinking like, oh yeah, whatever. Yeah, I didn't. I just, I didn't like this <laughs> segment at all, to be honest, because <laughs> I just I find it quite unsettling and unpleasant. And and again, it's like the idea is like being technically good at an instrument doesn't mean you are likely to be world class because there's an artistic interpretation there's an emotional mm. element to music that no matter how supple your wrists are if you lack that kind of heart like i suspect dr christopher <laughs> v- wagner does then you'll never be any good and maybe you can blame it on the fact that your fingers only you know can only be pulled back um, you know four millimeters rather than 46 yeah yeah but i'm sorry if it's not there here then it doesn't matter. And and if you feel a love for the music and instrument, but you don't want to become a professional, then you don't need to worry about any of this bullshit. No, no. Actually, that that, that, that thing about the, the hands being like having a giant hand or a small hand doesn't have any yeah. effects on piano playing. Although it's interesting because I've always wondered about Elton John's yeah. hands. You ever see Elton John's hands? Yeah. They are... Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. They, yeah. they look... Stubby little... <laughs> yeah, they're, they're yeah. practically stumps. <laughs> uh, one assumes King Charles must be a mean uh, pianist, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Actually, you've, haven't you played piano with Elton John, haven't you? <laughs> I have played <laughs> piano with Elton John, yeah. <laughs> when I was two or three years old, Russ, he invited me over yeah. in and the, even, uh, even, the foyer of the hotel. Even then, your hands absolutely... <laughs> Dwarfed, dwarfed his, his. <laughs> yeah he, I, I gave him a high five and i bent all his fingers back with the sheer toddler force of my giant hand i couldn't find any and christopher wagner i couldn't find anything about dr christopher wagner um but i'm much to um, his chagrin i would say i did find dr christoph wagner who oh. is a, a world-class cellist <laughs> <laughs> lovely <laughs> which i thought was quite one in one that's, one in the is... eye there yeah other than that i think that's uh Certain hands are musically useless. That's what we're told at one point. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, mine are, but... Uh, but That's because you never learned. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, but they're, they're full of musical potential, Russ. <laughs> but you use them for uh, dirtier pursuits, you <laughs> For over a hundred years, Germany's economic power has been based firmly on coal particularly on the massive coal fields of the Ruhr, stretching along the northern banks of the Rhine. But no longer, the coal fields have gone into headlong decline. In fact, a modern German saying defines an optimist as a man who tries to sell coal from the Ruhr. Rightly or wrongly, Germany intends to power its future growth with nuclear energy. But nuclear energy brings with it all sorts of problems, and already millions of pounds are being spent on what to do when things go wrong. In April 1971, just outside Karlsruhe, a small capsule fell from a transporter onto the roadside. It lay undiscovered for six hours. It contained highly toxic radioactive plutonium. Luckily, no one was hurt. But since then, the nuclear research station at Karlsruhe have been making sure that in future, luck won't be so critical a factor. They're developing robots that can cope with a nuclear accident while a highly skilled team of operators remains remote and safe from the radiation. And already the team has gone into training. Robot One, a mobile Geiger counter that can measure the levels of radiation. They've nicknamed it the Sniffer. The sniffer's driven by a small two-stroke engine, and its movements can be very finely controlled by radio over a range of several hundred yards, so that the operator isn't put at risk. This capsule could well contain a Cobalt-60 isotope, the sort that is used daily in hundreds of labs and hospitals throughout Europe. Properly shielded, they present no danger. But let loose, the gamma radiation can kill. There is gamma radiation, a lot of it. The emergency squad can't approach without a shield. They call up robot number two. This huge driverless shovel is almost a thousand times heavier than the sniffer, but it's controlled in much the same way. 
its first task to quarry dirt. Earth makes an excellent radiation shield and tons of it are heaped around the capsule to absorb the radiation. The shovel heaves away at its appointed task until the wall is five foot high and three foot thick. And that's enough. Then robot number three is guided in. This is perhaps the most critical stage of all. The capsule is much too hot to be handled on its own. It must be gingerly lifted into the drum. This strange crane was specially designed for the task. With its crab-like pincers, it will have to lift the drum over the wall and down beside the capsule. The whole operation must be carried out remotely, a delicate business. But the skills and experience that are being built up on this sort of exercise are already helping with the design of remotely controlled systems to be used in much more complex nuclear emergencies. Even a power station reactor out of control, for example. This is a training exercise, but as Germany's nuclear power program goes into high gear, next time it could be a real emergency. Once the drum's in position, they've reached the final and in many ways most dangerous phase of the recovery, picking up the capsule itself. One of the operators said that controlling these pincers is like trying to write upside down by looking into a mirror. It's a knack that only a few men can master. In the control cabin, everything goes quiet. They've been at work for over eight hours without a break. A tiny lapse of concentration now, and they could have to start again almost from the beginning. It's in the bag at last, and from now on it's easy. The fourth and last vehicle lumbers into position, ready for its cargo. A second remotely controlled crane, this time carrying a massive electromagnet, grasps the drum and swings it back over the wall. The drum itself, though of heavy steel, still doesn't provide sufficient protection against all kinds of radiation. So it's lowered gently into a heavy lead-lined container on the back of the specially designed transporter. Nine hours and ten minutes after the alarm bells rang and the emergency is over. The loss of the capsule was a minor accident. But as the concrete is poured for tomorrow's nuclear power stations and radioactive materials proliferate in hospitals and factories and universities, the scientists at Karlsruhe work away at a technology they hope never to put to use. Now you're saying, <coughs> saying your notes, Mark, uh, this has a sort of slight feeling of Thunderbirds about it, doesn't it? Mm. And I think would be vastly improved if they actually had some of the Thunderbirds music underneath. Because anything exciting, <laughs> I do think if you if you watched if you watched that actual episode of Thunderbirds without any of the without any of the music. Oh right, yeah. yeah. Underneath it, it probably would also be quite boring because it is just usually just vehicles manoeuvring <laughs> along ramps. That's, that's a very very good slowly. Right? <laughs> you, are, you are correct. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, uh, yeah. It's a shame. It's a shame the makers of this of this didn't consider doing that. And I did check that Thunderbirds was a known thing in Germany. They did have it. It was a known thing. They did okay. have it on in Germany. And Germany is the only country known to have put an age restriction on episodes of Thunderbirds, deeming it unsuitable for children under the age of six. Oh. So. Oh. All that peril. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Yeah. So this, so yeah, this this segment would have been exciting if you had Thunderbirds music under it. <laughs> Yeah. And shorter. Yeah. I, I've literally had time to go off and make an entire cup of tea <laughs> and come back. So, yeah, so you've missed loads of it, Mark. How, can, you, can you remember oh, everything can that we, happened? Can we watch it again? <laughs> <laughs> 
think I can, Russ. I think I can. Yeah, no, I, we are now, I just looked at the time code, and we are now exactly halfway through the program. Yeah, and, it's amazing, and, isn't it? And we've talked about two things. <laughs> well, we haven't talked about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And I, I think we've only actually been talking about the, me- the episode for about 25 minutes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We've got three row, but I would say that only the first one would qualify in my mind as a ro- as a as a robot. In the it was it's a specially built um, vehicle yes. that is con- a I- remote control vehicle. Whereas the other two, one's a digger and another one, the other one's a crane, and it, yeah, they just happen- remote control vehicles. Just happen to yeah. be re- remote control from afar. Yeah. I, I still think to be a robot, you have to have a, an element of kind of programmable autonomy to it. Like, the, like the ro- you think of the robot arm in a factory, no one's actually controlling them. They've been right. programmed to do it. But I think of the three, I, I agree. Well, let, let's put it this way. Only one of them is like a specialist bit of kit that they've had to design from scratch. Yeah, yeah. And, that, and that's the first one, the sniffer, which is this diesel-powered <laughs> um, beast of a of a remote control machine that kind of drives around and makes sure it, and goes there. Oh yeah, yeah, that radioactive thing. Yeah, it's radioactive. Yes. What that what that thing that's just falling out of that big yellow crate with big radioactive signs yeah. all over it. Yeah. Why 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 wasn't that crate sealed sealed closed with a lock or something? Why should they be afraid to just tumble I, off the I do. tumble off a lorry and fall open like that? I do appreciate this is a reconstruction of something that happened, you know, a few years ago. But like, you, you do wonder, like, it's was was the one was the actual event was it equally as unthrilling as this, or was there an element of danger to it? Because this is just so kind of you, you're right. I like it to Thunderbirds, but I did also liken it to the Keystone Cops. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's something really rinky dink and amateurish about the whole setup. I did enjoy. I did enjoy the the. The, the level of color coordination, though, like oh, a hundred percent. Basically, it, it's a, it's just everything is either grey or yellow involved. Everything yes. involved in the operation, and the, with the exception of the incredible purple flowering tree in the background, there's some sort of weird thing going on with the undergrowth in this program. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll mention later. It seems like all of the undergrowth in this part of Germany is purple, and I don't know, and I'm not sure whether it's just a film, it's some sort of do with the film, but it looks great against the yellow. It's just got purple, purple undergrowth. It looks brilliant. Oh, but oh, it's a side effect of the radioactivity, probably. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so we, we just we just see the three robots completing their task, um, which is just to chuck it in a barrel and then chuck it in the back of a lorry, really, isn't it? And again, that was so underwhelming, wasn't it? It was like, so we have the sniffer, which goes along, checks that the radioactive thing is radioactive. Then they send in the digger, which then just makes a giant earth bank half. You know, to provide a barrier to, to allow two guys to dump an empty barrel next to it so that a third robot, which is just a JCB with a kind of a, a grabber attachment, goes in, picks up the barrel, lifts it over the earth mound, then picks up the loose mini radioactive canister and then just and very amusingly just drops it into the barrel from a great high and the barrel doesn't have water in i mean i can see why you could would not put water in because if there's a leak in the barrel then you're leaking radioactive water it doesn't have it doesn't even have like feathers in. It just goes, <laughs> it just goes, and then we don't see this bit somehow the lid gets back on the barrel now there is all the equipment is big and cumbersome and I think lacks the sophistication and elegance to put a lid back in a barrel. Mm. I really genuinely believe <laughs> two of those men quickly run in, put the <laughs> lid on the barrel, like, and then run away and try and do it in like 12 seconds minimum. Yeah, yeah. It is interesting that's we it. don't see that bit. We do not see that because that's, that that's the dangerous bit. Yeah, yeah. You've got it back in the barrel. Well done, chaps. Now what? You got to put the lid back on, yeah, uh, and then and then a magnet picks it up and sticks it in a thing, and then it gets buried. And it's like, and 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 as quickly as I've described it, is as quickly as you could have shown it. <laughs> <laughs> but it took them nine hours and ten minutes, apparently. I know. I which know. again, also tosh, not working. That's what they were. Like, there's no way it took that long. Oh, well, it should have taken that long. I'm sure it did take that long. Yeah. Yeah, long lunch breaks, maybe. So really, the thing that kind of fascinated me most was that the guy who has the first remote control device, the sniffer, that lovely little fun thing, is he jealous of the guy who remote controls the earth-moving JCB thing? Mm. Because as you pointed out, the earth-moving JCB thing comes with a similar they're, concept of a remote control they're, they're, device they're, and, they're, and it straps yeah, over your shoulders big, big but it's twice as yeah, big yeah, yeah, yeah twice yeah, as yeah, big yeah. The, the sniffer one is kind of it's still like at his chest and it's like still like a little table and then he has and he's controlling it with his two hands yeah. kind of you know as, as it's strapped onto his shoulders but the jcb one is twice the size <laughs> yeah. which obviously 
is not a requirement no. of a remote. You can, in fact, it could be half the size and it wouldn't matter. No. It's still sending the same signals. Are they jealous of each other? Because the second guy looked fucking smug. <laughs> <laughs> he looked like he was. He'd won the lottery of life, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, oh, oh, halves. You wouldn't be able to even control the, uh, this, this size of the yeah. equipment. <laughs> your, your wrists there are not subtle, <laughs> supple enough. <laughs> We actually we didn't get didn't say to see who was who was controlling robot number three though did we? No, we didn't. No, yeah. no. Yeah. Which obviously made me that thing made me think of the thing in fairgrounds that where they pick up the the soft toys yeah. from the machine. Yeah, uh, maybe maybe he's like they they looked around for Carney. Do you think it's just yeah a they, yeah they looked for, for the Europe's best uh, use yeah. of one of those machines. Somebody can get a soft toy out of there every time, and uh, and he's the one that's operating that. This this Kulzra Institute of Technology is still there. And it's still all about nuclear safety. Uh, right? You know, Euratom. They're, yes, they're, I yes that. yeah, they're all involved. They're all involved and and run the place. And it's still and they're still you know doing projects looking at nuclear safety all around Europe and things like. That. Even though obviously Germany famously uh, is no longer a nuclear powered nation, they had their first nuclear power plants in 1969. It got to the point where it was accounting for, for a quarter of all their power. And then in 2011, uh, they decided to get rid of all their nuclear plants. And so they shut down their last one in 2023. So there's no nuclear power plants there now. So they just run on coal and all that lovely stuff instead. So that we no longer use. Yes, yeah. yeah. Isn't that amazing that we're ahead of them. That? Yeah. Astonishing, I think really. it's a little bit of a shame, really, of Germany especially, because like most of the famous nuclear scientists from the from back in yeah. the day were German. So they obviously had a lot of uh, expertise there, uh, although a lot of them did all move to America, I guess. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but obviously robots, wobots, wobots are you know big news these days, and are a bit of a no-brainer for dealing with nuclear stuff. So we we have a lot of different people doing different nuclear robot things. It turns out in Birmingham in 2018, they actually they actually built the National Centre for Nuclear Robotics. Yes, yeah. yeah, that's cost them forty-two million pounds, and that's that is actually that's that's purely to deal with all of the nuclear waste that we've got in Britain. Because it turns out that yeah. we've got the by far the most nuclear waste of anybody, and well, we did uh, the longest, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, well, even more the Americans. Oh no, in Europe, in Europe. Oh, in Europe. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Because there's four point nine million tons of nuclear waste that we need to think of what to do mm, with. Delicious. And Sellafield have got a thing called they got you know Boston Dynamics, the one who do really the really yes. cool robots. So if you yes. look at the bottom of the the thing there, they got Boston Dynamics Ooh. to build a thing which they call Spot, and that is a that's one of Boston Dynamics robot dogs. Oh yeah, Sellafield Limited, yeah. And the Spot has got lidar, and that sort of that head bit is like a grabbing hand, mm. and so. He can go in uh, into into the nuclear areas and s- like scan the room and 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 work out what's going on in there, and then use his arm to move things around and take things to testing and all things like that. So that is a robot, now, isn't it? That, that, that's, that, that, that's, a that's a robot. robot. <laughs> that's a robot, Russ. There's your robot. Yeah, yeah. I don't know whether they programmed him to make barking noises. I hope they have some sort of nuclear bark. And then obviously, actually, weirdly, I thought it was just weird. I don't really notice this in The Guardian yesterday. No. Guardian yesterday, so the 2nd of November, the, t- the headline was, Robot Retrieves Radioactive Fuel Sample from Fukushima Nuclear Site. So that day, they had, yes, they had just sent in a robot right into the middle of one of the reactors at Fukushima. Wow. And it had clipped off a three gram sample of the manky radioactive nonsense that's in there after you're following the meltdown. And they're going to take that sample, bring it out, and as long as it's not not so radioactive, they can't study it, which which, which is a poss- possible risk. Which is a possible. <laughs> <yeah. laughs> they're going to study it, work out what's wrong, and it's going to probably hopefully help them clean up Fukushima, uh, you know, more efficiently. And that was oh. that happened yesterday, Mark. What are the chances of that, eh? That's amazing. Yeah. Very rarely do we get to steal from the Guardian before they steal from us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. How do you like that? How do you like that, Guardian? Ah, they don't taste so good, no. do they? <laughs> <laughs> I just want, I, I want to say one more thing, actually, sorry, just because just I was just looking at the notes here. One of the operators said that controlling these pincers is like trying to write upside down whilst looking into a mirror. It's a knack that only a few men can master. <laughs> it's a fucking remote control car. Uh, g- give, <laughs> get over yourself. Also, surely, is it, right, is it right upside down? Yeah. Writing upside down whilst looking into a mirror. Surely it's easier to write upside down if yeah. you're looking into a mirror because it makes that's, you write in the right way up. 
doesn't it? Correct, Russell, because you can actually see the correct. Yeah, word. yeah no, absolutely. Yeah. So I mean, actually, what you said, maybe that's an old German expression that means it's easy. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's probably what it means, right? <laughs> The Spiegel. There we go, it's German. I know that. The Spiegel. Very good. Yes. Very good newspaper, right? Yeah, yes. Right, next. Telephone numbers. If you're anything like me, you have an enormous problem in trying to remember them, particularly foreign ones. It's not that they use different numbers. They use the twos and the ones and the threes and the fours, just like we do. But somehow they fall into difficult and hard to remember patterns, like 6411438. 2093. Difficult, eh? But now a German company has come up with a neat and very sophisticated little package which could help people with my sort of problem and make searching around in telephone directories really a thing of the past. With this system, all you have to remember is the name and you can dial it directly onto the telephone. You've got a little card here which translates the numbers into letters so that you can spell it out. But first of all, you have to get in touch with a particularly well-informed and well-spoken computer. In fact, he speaks several languages fluently, including English. Wait a moment until he comes on. Here he comes now. This is Directory Information Unit. Please give the last name. Now, that isn't just the recorded voice speaking. That's the computer selecting a whole series of syllables and putting them together to make words and sentences. It really is a talking computer. Now, the name of the person I want to speak to is Schmidt. Now, literally just spell it out. S-C-H-M, if I could only spell, I-D-T. Now, what happens? Is the party you require a gentleman? I want to know if she's a man. Well, she's not. Please give the first name. Anna. No problem there. A-N-N-A. -N -N -A. Now, if we're lucky, this computer's crisp metallic tones will get the number. The number is 7327. 7327. At the moment, this is really just a sort of sophisticated toy. It's reserved entirely for the employees of this company. But already there's a project to extend it to the citizens of Munich, and that's several million people, then perhaps the whole of Germany, and who knows, by 1984, say, all the citizens of Europe will be inscribed on this computer's remorseless and infallible memory. But by then you'll need to remember much more than just the name to identify any individual. You have to have at least the address, age, perhaps place of work, income. Even I might find it easier to remember that telephone number. Now, what was that telephone number it gave me? Yes, 7327. Let's try it. 7327. Well, it's ringing. This is a recording. If you wish to leave a message, will you please speak now? <laughs> well, you can't win them all. Willy Woolly's intro to this is such a colossal load of confidence. <laughs> 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 and, and, as you mentioned before, the, the, the idea that he's gaslighting us. Yes. This, this is almost like, you know, those um, infomercials. Yeah. That's, yeah yep, infomercials yep. where they, they pretend that there's a problem with whatever everyone oh. uses. And, and somebody completely incompetent tries to use a perfect, yeah. oh. like a corkscrew oh. or a oh. grater yeah. or whatever. Oh. And they can't yeah. do it. And then the, the new thing comes in and they're master at it immediately. This is Willy Woolly's attempt to suggest that German phone numbers are in any way more complicated or difficult than UK phone numbers. It's just a complete nonsense, isn't it? It's absolute tosh. It's, it's like it's painfully tosh. <laughs> yeah, it's just so <laughs> stupid. I can't say, where is the... I don't, I'm, not, I'm not even sure I bothered writing down his quote about, you know, it's, it's just, yeah. Well, but first, first, it's of all, first of all, he says... Difficult passages, well, yeah, that's but, what I remember. The first, the first bit he says, he says... Well, oh, they, yeah. they, they use the same numbers as us, two, four, six, and so forth. Oh, here we go. You written it down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I, yeah. I think, what do you mean they use the same numbers as us? I mean, what, what else would they use? Roman numerals? Like, yeah. Of course they use the same numbers as us. And then, and then yeah, and then he says... Yeah, and um, Difficult and hard to remember patterns. They're difficult and hard to remember patterns. It's a, just a list of... It's a row of numbers. Yeah. You could actually say them in any way you want. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So as you convey the correct numbers in the correct order, you have passed over that information. I, I found this 
because th- th- this is like this is painfully long as well. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I th- I mean... is this is this in real time? Have they edited anything? <laughs> So he's, he's he's sitting in his in his cafe there. It looks like a lovely mm. cafe. It does look like a lovely cafe. First floor, odd odd choice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm not really sure why he's sitting in the cafe because then once he comes to demonstrate the uh, phone, the, this new phone system to us, he cuts straight to a to a, an empty office instead. Mm. Where obviously you know he could have just sat in the office for the whole thing. Really, I don't know. But I suppose it makes it slightly more interesting, doesn't it? Yeah, stick a stick a pin in that, Mark. Does it make it slightly more interesting? <laughs> Um, <laughs> let's let's consider that later, Russ. <laughs> He's got his phone. He's going to show us this new system of le- dialing with letters. So he has to get this special overlay that he puts on his phone, which is branded with the Siemens logo. I noticed there, mm. Mark. Siemens, the finest makers of telephone letter overlays. That, that I, know. I certainly well, went uh, my, my, bought one immediately. My my assumption is that everything is Siemens. That this is a Siemens. He's in the Siemens yes, office. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, he's, yeah, clearly. yeah he's clearly in the Siemens Go office. Go figure. Yeah, 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 clearly. Yeah. Yeah, and what well, the one thing I think is quite advanced is the idea that there's a robot rather than it being because I don't can't see why there would be wouldn't just be a recorded voice. Mm. There's not though. There's a robot voice at the other end which is mm. constructing words from from syllables. So it's talking to him in a robot syllable made voice, and then like he and it's basically it's 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 automated director inquiries is is what it yeah. is what it is. And I think that's what's interesting there is that obviously we have director inquiries. And always have had it, and obviously these days it's it's done with voice recognition, which we'd never be able to do in the 1970s. But we we never had this, even despite all of our phones having letters on them, we never had a system where we could type in names. So no. it's weird that that was never adopted. And then that brought me to the other thing that we were talking about: why is it that in American stuff they have phone numbers with words in them, and we don't? Yeah, because it was it was something I always grew up. Being aware of, but never, never really understanding, or never really thinking hard to go like, oh, how come, how come their number is one eight hundred, you know, yeah, whatever, yeah, uh, you know, got, uh, plumbing got junk is a is a big yeah, famous yeah. one, yeah, yeah. Although we did have one, Mark, I found the one case, oh, the one case of on. us having one. Obviously, yeah. in in the in the early in the early two thousands, is this? Can I guess? Is this something to do with double glazing or something? No, no, no. It, uh, okay. I think you'll remember this advert once we see it. Oh, because okay. I remember this advert. Starring right wing firebrand Holly Valance. <laughs> no coins for a call. No problem. Right, oh eight hundred reverse. Do I need to spell it out? Dial O eight hundred R E V E R S E. It's the new way to call reverse charge. 0800 reverse. It's the new way to call reverse charge. RSE. Uh, I remember the logo. Actually, I don't remember the ad, but yeah, <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it? <laughs> Holly Valance has had an interesting uh, trajectory in life, hasn't she? Hasn't she just? Isn't she married to one of the Candy Brothers or whatever? Yeah, very, yeah. very interesting and like uh, now, journey. And now she's like, been like on. speaks at Trump events and things like that. She does, yeah. Never... And Farage. She almost ran as an MP, or a candidate, I suppose. I won. I yeah. wonder whether she would have been a better pick for vice for presidential vice president, actually, because they, they wouldn't have to change the signs very much. They just have to put <laughs> they just change Vance to Valance. She is a naturally born Australian, though. Isn't she? <laughs> yeah, but you know, it would have added a bit of uh, glamour to the to the bit, Trump ticket, true. wouldn't it? Bit, bit of glam. Bit of glamour. Um, now, I'm, I'm going to suggest that that. Well, well found. That that is a good bit of truffle hunting. So what I said to you in my notes is that I so when I was growing up, we would have a variety of rotary phones and button phones, and they always used to have the little letters on. But obviously, yeah. because they were never used, they were just there. They were just present, but I never thought about them. And it was only when mobile phones became popular, and you would tap the letters, you know, three for a C, you know, three, pre- that I understood what the letters were. And then, kind of retrospectively, I was like, "Ah, oh, now I understand the numbers in America." Yeah, that ad is clearly what two thousand something. Like and that. I would yeah, suggest, I, I I would suggest that the only reason that became something was because of SMS text. Oh yeah, that yeah, they, yeah. yeah that, that it wasn't that we'd always use the system and we'd forgotten. It's more like, oh, people now know what the letters are in numbers, and they will understand what they're doing. So the reverse equates to the numbers. Whereas, like, yeah. Uh, that would be my theory. It was like it's clearly in a post 
Does he leave his mobile phone behind? No, he doesn't have a mobile phone, does he? He, he no, has keys no. and coins. But Mark, um, that presents yes, the Russell. question. Mm. And this is the most interesting bit. That presents the question, why did British phones always have... Well, that's what I was on. hoping you might tell me, because like they've... Or indeed Irish, because that's... Or like, Irish, you know, yes. I was yeah, a child, yeah. yeah. Why were they always there if they were never used? Was well, it some kind of universal they, standard or something? They were used, Mark. That's the oh. thing. That's the thing. They were used. So, obviously, back in the day, we used to have operators. So you'd call up the operator and go, operator, get me so-and-so. And they would know what to do. But then in the 19... Uh, 1958, the concept is something called subscriber trunk dialing, STD, was uh, introduced. Uh, an unfortunate uh, yeah. acronym there. And the idea was that they would do away with the operator and we would be able to direct dial whoever we wanted. But in order to direct dial whoever we wanted, they would have to set up area codes for everyone and all of this. So their initial thought was how are we going to simplify the creation of area codes? So they come up with the idea of making it so that the, the the number corresponded to the to the first letter or first letters oh. of the exchange you were phoning. Mm. So this is why Birmingham's area code is 021, because it's two, two is for B, mm-hmm. which is obviously that the B is found on the on the two key on the phone. Or uh, Glasgow is 041, because Gla- the G is found on the four key of the phone. Manchester is 061, because M is found in the six key, et cetera, Mark. So that works for big cities. Obviously, there's more more than you've got. You know, you've got to get then dial down to the local ex- mm. whatever the local exchanges. And there's like six thousand different. There was well, there was six thousand different ex- local exchanges. So then they came up with the idea of the next three digits being the the first three letters of the local exchange. So and then, so <laughs> I hope you're writing this down. Mark. Is this still is this still? I, no, I'm sense? following. I'm following. Yeah, yeah. I am following. Yeah. yeah so yeah. so. And then the last four digits was just a number, and that was the number that identified the house. Yeah. So you, so they put this together. So, for example, if I lived outside, so if I lived in London, and I had a friend who lived in Anfield, I, I would be able to work out what the code, what the code was to phone them, because it would be, it would be zero, then the number with L on it. So you dial, you would dial zero L one, and then you would dial A N F, and then their four-digit phone number. So like one, two, three, four. So actually what you would dial is 0512631234. The idea was that letters would be easier to remember the codes. So that's so that was the system they set up. And they worked out mm. they worked out letter codes for every, every single exchange. But the, the 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 problem is is that there's a, there's places in Britain that have the first same first three letters. Yeah. And also you have to know the geography of Britain yeah. to know which which is their local exchange. And, yeah, and how the exchange, it's not, it's, how the exchanges it's are related not, to each other. You don't need to know where they are. You need to know what their exchange name is. Yes, basically. Yeah, 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 yeah. So by 1966, they realised that this was a actually was a over over complicating matters, and they just yeah. they just gave up the system. So they they just told everyone what the numbers were, and everyone just yeah. just got the ability to memorise numbers um, or write them down or or write, or write them down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're listening, Willy Wooly. But the, but the interesting thing is, is that even to this day, sixty percent of phone numbers still because they haven't changed still work on this system. So you, so you could theoretically. If you were trying to work out somebody's phone number, have a better chance of working out what their phone number was if they still had a landline and they still lived where you thought they lived mm. by using this system to work out their dialing code. Uh, but yeah, it, it would still be yeah no, it would still probably probably only half and half chance to get it right. But I thought that was I thought that was interesting. Um, yeah. But and also so America also also adopted so that's why they got the they also got the letters on their phone numbers for the same reason. And I, what I didn't realize is that, the, you know, the Glenn Miller song, famous Glenn Miller song, uh, Pennsylvania 6500, 65,000. Yeah. 65,000, 65,000, 65,000. 65,000. Yeah, it's Pennsylvania 65,000, isn't it? So that is the phone number of the Hotel Pennsylvania in New York, and it's um, it's PE 65,000. So it's actually, so to this day, if you want to phone up the Hotel Pennsylvania in New York, it is 736 hmm. And then... Then the one that got me was, you know, in in films, I, yes. I've not and I've, I've not heard anybody do this recently, but it used to be the case where that somebody would go uh, get me Klondike five so and so. They'd say the word Klondike. Yeah. And I said, what, what what's Klondike? I was doing the thing. 
the first two letters of Klondike are KL, which are 5-5. Five, five. So actually they're saying, five, get five, me five. fair 5-5, five, five, which is famously yeah. the Hollywood fake phone yeah. number. Yeah, the dead, the dead set. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 So that's oh. why they say, get me Klondike 5, so-and-so, and so-and-so. And I thought, ah. Oh. That's a moment of realisation. That's my big moment of realisation in this in this uh, ah, in this episode. Very good. Mark. Yeah, but yeah, the, the use of but then the use of them is like vanity and advertising things. Yeah, obviously never took off in Britain, but Americans uh, embraced it. Canada does it as well. Australians love doing it. I think the Australian telephone companies make quite a lot of money selling them. Oh, um, selling words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, uh, Russia and, and Japan even do actually. I think Japan's because but Japan's is more pun based or something because the way their language works, it's, yeah. it's more to do with the pronunciation of things rather than uh, the actual letters. Yeah, and it's, it's got its proper name is called phone words. Yeah. No one really knows why it didn't take off in the UK. I, some suggestions just say that it just looks tacky, you know, in the same way that personalized it does look tacky. personalized number plates look tacky. <laughs> Yeah, or they just maybe just look too American. <laughs> which is oh well, uh, yeah. Wait, yeah. Are, are they not the same thing? Yeah, but, the, but my favorite, my favorite bit uh, of this all was I just saw somebody on Twitter say, so, so "said I went out for a while with a Canadian whose number translated to big shit." <laughs> <laughs> That's how she gave out her number to people. No. <laughs> yeah. No, don't do that. It was awesome. But even she admitted it was a little bit tedious getting sniggering teenagers calling her all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that made me laugh. So that's, that's that element of it. And then we've got Siemens, Mark. Mm-hmm. Another one of these old, big old companies. But Siemens are, are really big in telephone exchanges. There's a reason why Willy Woolly is... Is here in the uh, in the seam. I presume he's in the Siemens building because he's phoning their internal their internal yeah. network. It was founded in Berlin in eighteen forty seven, and they they came up with the idea. You know, obviously the telegraph mm-hmm. that used to be done on Morse code. They come up with with a, with a machine that instead of sent, instead of Morse code, it had a needle that pointed to letters, so mm-hmm. you could you could just you could read it without knowing Morse code. Yeah, oh, that's good. So they came up with that. And then they started building um, telegraph lines all around Europe, the long distance ones. And then in 1867, they built a telegraph line that ran from London to Calcutta, 11,000 wow. kilometers. It's pretty impressive, That's isn't mad. it? It's mad. Yeah. How do you, I mean, how do you, do you just like march, just march through everyone's country, just putting it up? Or, or like, and back, how do you, back then? How do you stop, I think so. How do you stop people, how do you stop people sabotaging it? I, mean, I, I don't know, Russell. Had, maybe just pe- maybe just people were better back then, and they were less like you. <laughs> yeah, 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 maybe. They also provided power. They provided the the, the power like the power generator for the world's ev- first ever street lighting. Do you know electric street lighting? Do you know where that was? Uh, the world's first yeah. street lighting. Yeah, electric. Yeah, in the world yeah, first. Yeah, 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 um, yeah, 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 yeah. Paris. Godalming in Surrey. Godalming. Godalming, yes. <laughs> oh, okay. I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I didn't know that either. Oh, okay. One bad thing they did, though, is they did start the Osram light bulb company, which obviously is, as <gasps> last episode we found out, are evil. Bunch of shysters, right? Yeah, yeah, Fuck yeah, it. yeah. But then, yeah, they, but then hell. since then, they did a lot of done things. But the, but mainly, they invented most of the different it, the various like phone exchange technology advances have been done by Siemens. So I can see why this is, they've got this. Yeah. Obviously I, this this never took off exactly, but I mean there are elements of it that did take off. The element of phoning a robot for direct inquiries exists. Yeah. But we, ours is more like press 1 for so and so, press 2 for so and so, press 3 for Yeah. Which seems like a more simple system than typing in typing in a word. Typing yeah. in a word, but typing in a word is more flexible, isn't it? It, it, it is, but but you know, most most of the time you're able to kind of whittle down your choices, you know, from a maximum of nine, right? Yeah. And what I was very surprised, but is a one more eight, one more eight still exists. Who uses oh, that? God, I have no idea. That was such a big deal when they um, opened that up yeah. and started setting it off. Yeah, it costs two pound forty three a minute to find them up. Get out of town. <laughs> Google it. <laughs> I wonder. I wonder how many calls they get a day. What a great question. What a great question. But yeah, so I mean, it's a, well, yeah, it's a, I, I think it's an interesting. I think it's an interesting look at what was to come. I think because Willie Woolley says that by 1984, 1984, 
uh, all the citizens of Europe will be inscribed on this computer's remorseless and infallible memory. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Which sounds like a threat to me. Remorseless and infallible sounds like, you know. He, he does say it with a smile on his face, but it, it, this, is one of the, this is another one of those segments where what it ostensibly is being explained to us is not the most interesting thing. It's all the background stuff. Is It's this computer system that seems to have created to allow people to enter information, to get information back. Yeah. That's the interesting thing, and it's like, <laughs> but he he thinks it's the words. <laughs> it's peculiar, isn't it? Which, by your reckoning, has been around for twenty years at this point. Yes, well, yeah, or or been binned off twenty years ago. In <laughs> fact, <laughs> why is he and why is he using an overlay actually? Because all phones yeah, have, all they phones all come have, with them. Have, have, <laughs> yeah. He's found the one phone in Germany that hasn't got the overlay on it already. Yeah, amazing overlay, overlay. <laughs> <laughs> Next. Today's West Germans enjoy their affluence, but there are nearly a thousand who can't enjoy the normal pleasures of life, just walking and talking, seeing and hearing. Most people have all their senses and take them for granted, but a tiny fraction are blind and about the same number are deaf. This new centre in Hanover was built to help those who are not only blind, but deaf as well. To be deprived of both senses is a handicap that the normal person finds hard to imagine. It means that communication with the outside world is severely restricted. The blind deaf are almost completely dependent on others to help them understand their world. Their whole life is limited to what they can touch, smell or taste. Most of these people can now speak to each other by a finger language but they hardly ever go outside the walls of an institution, except with a chaperone who speaks the same language. Even inside special environments, problems arise. The Hanover Centre has set out to harness modern technology to extend the lives of these people, to include activities that, until now, would have been outside their reach, like nine-pin bowling. The pleasure of playing this sort of game depends on instant feedback. The player wants to know right away how many skittles he's knocked over. For the blind deaf, it's something he can't know on his own. But with this bowling alley, he becomes independent. He can literally feel his score. These footstoppers tell him which direction to throw. From there, he can use sensations in his own body, like balance and the movement of his muscles. The scoring system is simple. When a skittle drops, the attached string pulls a switch and so causes the corresponding button to click down. It's not quite as satisfying as hearing the skittles fall, but it's better than nothing. Till now, lifts have been beyond the blind deaf, who can't hear buzzers or see lights telling them when the lift has arrived. So a vibrating handrail gives these passengers the signal that the lift has arrived and the doors opened. But the question still remains, what if the lift stops at the wrong floor? Since she can't see, illuminated numbers are useless. So they've installed a column of buttons and the center of each one vibrates. The buttons correspond to particular floors. Now at last, they won't need a member of the staff to go with them every time. It's only in this century that Helen Keller and Anne Sullivan, between them, invented the hand language, which has changed the lives of the blind deaf. The German version is based on Braille, each letter of the alphabet having its own symbol. But the snag is that you have to be within touching distance. So the centre has installed the world's first Braille telephone. The caller dials a number, just as with an ordinary phone, but instead of ringing a bell, a signal is sent by radio. And it's picked up on a vibrator carried by the subscriber whose number is dialed. He now knows to go to his own office where he has his personal braille phone. This man is blind but not deaf. He's Herr Maha, director of the centre. He's expecting a call from the catering manager, Herr Stuck. The message, which is about the week's menu, is relayed, like all Brailleophone signals, by ordinary telephone lines. Each Braille character is carried over the cable as a series of pulsed tones. 
These tones are then electronically decoded and printed at the other end, then read, just like ordinary Braille. Herr Stark is both blind and deaf, but now he and other patients can play really useful roles in helping to run their own centre. By next year, blind deaf people in Frankfurt will be able to ring their friends in Munich. Each unit will cost about £2,000. Expensive, but surely well worth the extra dimension it brings to their lives. We'll start that segment with another little uh, montage of, of shots of, of Germans doing German things. And there's a couple of interesting things I, I, I spotted in that. Uh, the main one being... Do you think that is Rodney Dangerfield in there, <laughs> in that crowd shot? I um, yeah, there there is a, a, a Dangerfield esque quality to that individual. <laughs> isn't there? It's the eyes, right? Yeah, yeah. It's it's either that or it's somebody gasping for air on the surface of Mars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's getting no respect from that Bavarian man in a no. feathered hat, giant beard. I did notice in the in the end credits that the second unit director of this episode was Bob Sines. Yes. yes. And I wonder whether the second unit... I assume the second unit director is the person that goes around filming all of the yes, extraneous the stuff, aren't they? Yes, the location stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, the Bob, interstitial. Bob Sines, you know, could easily fit in with, with Bavarian society, I feel like. He's got that big beard and curly moustache, isn't he? And all that. Do you think he came back a changed man? Like, <laughs> uh, I've seen what it is that I need to be. <laughs> No, I was going to say, I think we were, I think we were both, um, we both enjoyed the same person playing uh, mini golf. Yeah, that that young lad, that young lad with the with high waisted short shorts and uh, knee yeah. length socks playing mini golf. Absolutely, as a powerful look. <laughs> yeah, he is. I, I, I I wish I had the the balls and guts to pull off an outfit like that. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not sure how long they would have lasted if they'd come 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 to our school mm. dressed dressed like that. <laughs> Uh, not, 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 not a long time. <laughs> yeah. I, the other thing I want to point out from the introduction, though, is this is another example where something is introduced with with a kind of a low level resentment, because it begins with the phrase "Today's West Germany." Sorry, today's West Germans enjoyed their affluence, mm. which which really sounds like one step away from saying that they're rubbing our noses <laughs> in it. <laughs> How dare they unabashedly enjoyed their affluence? <laughs> They haven't earned it. They should be no. They should be living in shame, Mark. There should have been a price, Russ. There yeah. should have been a price. <laughs> it's ba it's barely thirty years. It's not even thirty years. Is no, it? it's not even. It's not even yeah. thirty years. Not even your thirty years. And they're yeah, marching around the place like they, nothing ever happened. Um, yeah, I did. I, I have to say, I do like these nineteen seventies. I mean, have we only had one. I feel like we've had two. I'm not sure. The nineteen seventies piece is about people with disabilities yes because i think they're done in a much more interesting and positive way but because there's there's no sense of sim there's no sense of sympathy there's no sense of it like there's no sense of oh look at these poor people with all the yes. disadvantages and all, all that it's like these people are getting on with life and they're living rich and interesting lives despite think, you know they're off the top of my head we had the 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 woman with polio who uh was replacing leg braces oh, with some yes. new technology yeah, yeah. yeah and then there was uh the one long longer term listeners will remember my absolute fear when uh the Holland special uh went to a kind of a village Yes, to yeah, look yeah, at yeah. how uh, able-bodied and disabled people were living together. But again, both those pieces were done with a level of respect I found quite surprising, and the the individuals were not seen as pitiable. No, exactly. Yeah, and I much prefer that approach. Yes, and everyone seems to be having a great time, don't they? Having a ride. They do up. all look like they're having. It, it looks like a lovely place. Everyone looks really cheerful. They've got they've got yep. a bowling alley, which I mean, who doesn't want to live somewhere with a bowling alley, Mark? Oh Jesus, the dream, right? Yeah. Yeah, surely. Yeah, genuinely, yeah. Every every mansion I dream about has a has a bowling alley in it. <laughs> Fact. <laughs> this fellow we see bowling. Obviously, he's 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 both blind and deaf. He's not deaf blind. We're, we're told he's blind and deaf. He's, he's, but weirdly, I've only ever heard the phrase deaf blind. Deaf blind. Yeah. But throughout uh, yeah. throughout this piece, Derek Cooper, our narrator, yeah. only ever says blind deaf. Yeah. 
Why did he do that? Because uh, I, I don't know. Because I, I only knew it as deaf blind. I don't know. Well, uh, ex- exactly. I mean, you posit the idea, and like, no doubt you've researched it to an inch of his life. <laughs> yeah. That at some point they must have flipped the words yeah, well, and no, just settled. I, I did. Yeah. Well, I did wonder, but no, I, I, I did. I, no, I nothing. Checked deaf blind international. The the, the that sounds like a boy band. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be a really terrible boy, man, wouldn't they? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, they, they've always been. They, have, they haven't always been called Deafblind International, but they have always referred to the situation, situation as, being the situation deaf-blind. as being deafblind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it, rolls, yeah. it rolls off the tongue better than blind deaf, doesn't it? It does. It does. Yeah, yeah. Back to the bowler there, and I, I don't want to be stickler because, uh, in general, I think this is a very wholesome piece. It's very interesting, and as you say, that the the the, the place they all live seems lovely. And mm. that bowler is wearing a wristwatch, but it's not one of those tactile wristwatches that you can see. It clearly has mineral crystal display, and underneath was a normal handset with printed on <laughs> numbers. And I did wonder what the utility of that wristwatch was. Mm, don't know. Maybe you can. You also pointed out he's very good at bowling. <laughs> He's extraordinarily good at bowling. Extraordinary. He, he even puts a little spin in the ball. Yeah, the, right? the thing that even like I love bowling, but I'm still very much yeah, of yeah. the I'm still very much of the pick up the heaviest ball I can carry and bowl it as fast as I physically can straight down the middle and hope that and, and hope hope that yeah. sheer <laughs> that the sheer weight of physics means that they all go flying. Well, but back but, when you had uh, like a very odd job that had had you working one week on one week off, we would go bowling. Yeah. Moderately often, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ele- Elephant and, and Castle, the best bowling alley. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, in, in London. Yeah. And um, I I, th- I feel confident in saying that despite the many times we went bowling, we didn't learn anything. We no. didn't improve. <laughs> no, no. No, not at all. And yet this chap. Yeah, the, ho- the holy grail of, of bowling. Have you ever watched professional bowling on the telly? Oh. The holy grail of bowling is to get it, to give it a, good, a nice old curve to it. Yeah, beautiful. It comes beautiful. In. And this is what this yeah. fella's doing. Yeah, he is. And yeah. he's blind. I know. Is he? And he's not, well, he's also bowling in socks and sandals, which I don't know. Is that dangerous? I mean, you don't want to drop a bowling ball on a, on a, on a <gasps> sock. I hadn't even thought about on that. A oh, foot. no. Yeah. Oh, no. I, well, no, I wouldn't wear sandals anyway, but yeah, gotcha. I hadn't even thought about that bit. No. And how do you recover your ball when you've dropped it? I don't know. Uh, anyway, look, I don't want to be a stickler. I just, it was, there, was, there were a couple of these little anachronisms littered throughout the uh, <laughs> the pictures that I thought were intriguing to me. So, oh yes, you notice another one. Did you notice that the 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 fellow that comes the on bl- later, you- the guy the guy who's in charge, he's blind but not deaf, but he's in charge, and because we, we, we're going to learn about the braille phone. Mm. In his top pocket, there's a pen. Yeah. And I did wonder what the pen was for. Um, if he was genuinely blind, as we are told, maybe he used it to uh, poke poke. Uh, poke the the phone. You, maybe you should dial the phone with like a dialing wand. A dialing wand. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe just again, just 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 an observation. And you do, he but he's not made. he's not deaf, is he? So maybe he likes to click. No, he's not deaf. He likes no. the clicking sound it makes. Well, I mean, yes, possibly. Though I would slap it out of his hand if he did that in a meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, the, the other, we also see the lady getting the lift. Mm. Uh, the lift with the vibrating handrail. I thought it was an interesting yep. little feature. What colour was the lift, Mark? What did you say? Know, so what colour the lift was? <laughs> it was a red lift, Russ. It was a red lift, wasn't it, Mark? It was a red lift, yeah, Russ. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Can you think of any any films? Well, that I mean, feature, off the top of my prominently head. feature one or possibly I two. About it. Two bright red lifts. If I really put my mind to it. I can think and of who, one lift. Who, who, may have, who may have directed? I can think of one lift. Who directed the film uh, with red thing lifts is, this, in it? Thing is, though, Russ. Based on that, this could not be a reference to that film, Russ, because this was made seven years before that film came out. <laughs> so are you saying The Shining is a reference yes, to, to this a episode, one-off yes, yeah, yeah. special episode of Tomorrow's yeah, World? Yeah, that is what I'm saying, yes. All right, yeah. I, that's what I thought you were saying, Russ. <laughs> Crikey. My, I, I, I'm shook. My world has changed <laughs> inexorably. Oh, well, it's just interesting, Mark. You know, you know, just, yeah, just merely an observation. Yeah, exactly. I'm just. Oh, what's the word? I'm just, You're just asking, asking questions. questions. <laughs> just asking questions. But yeah, asking questions. There's not. There's not a huge amount to say about this, really. No. Uh, it's very interesting. It's very good. It's, yeah, it's a. It's a good. It's a good piece. It's nice to see these people having a laugh. I did obviously. I checked out the the, the whether this facility still exists. It does. Still, there's good. still one. There's one in Hanover, and there's one in another place in Germany that I can't pronounce. Go on, give it a go. No, I didn't. I didn't even write that. It was so long. Oh wow, it was okay. so long. All right, fine. I thought I'm not even going to write that down because yeah. I won't be able yeah. to pronounce it. So no one will know what I'm saying anyway. But but yeah, there is another one in Germany anyway. But this one, this Hanover one, 
It's uh, got 61 permanent residents, but then it's also got an education centre, a special kindergarten, a special needs school, and which also incorporates a boarding school as well for if, if they want to stay there. Yeah, and the residents all live in their own one-room apartments, and they've got their own bathroom and balcony. Hopefully, there's quite a high yep. uh, rail that on that balcony. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's got a media cafe. The bowling alley is still there, Mark. Mm. Um, they, they have music groups, and they obviously take them out on excursions. But that place, that Han- the place in Hanover, hosted the first ever world conference for deafblind people in 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 the eighties, and that was what sort of kickstarted this worldwide what would you call it organization, worldwide mm. organization, deafblind international. And they now they now represent deafblind people all around the world, and uh, they've got places they've got sort of services available in places as diverse as Cuba. Tanzania, as I would like to call it, <laughs> uh, Indonesia, Nepal, China, and Ukraine. Uh, the website's quite scary because if you try and move your mouse around the screen, it cut, it shouts at you because uh, oh, obviously okay. it's, it's, it's made to be disability mm-hmm. accessible. Mm-hmm. But you don't switch that on. It just does it automatically. And I, I, I had my speakers on quite loud because I've been listening to David Hasselhoff recently, previously and uh, suddenly my computer started shouting at me unexpectedly. But yeah, so but the, the that Braille phone, mm. we live in a world of smartphones now so smart so phones are you know have no tactility whatsoever these days mm. but what we what we do have to do now is bluetooth and if you if you want to use braille on any and any basically any, techno, any technological device like a computer or, or a phone or whatever anything like that you can get bluetooth braille devices now and there's one just there's one at the bottom of the dock there mm. you see it which has got the hilarious brand name of brilliant like that I don't, have, hate, no, it. don't, don't I hate it. I don't hate that. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got those eight keys at the top, which are for typing, typing Braille. And then that, there's that row at the, underneath. Mm. And what happens there is their little, their little pins in the, in the shape, in the, in the two by four shape of what Braille is, is constructed in. And they move. So they, they, they basically create Braille under your fingers. So you, so mm. as that machine is reading, as reading a screen or whatever, they will, convert into the correct braille under your very fingertips and you can just run your fingertips across there and read it like that so once you've got that one of them you can can basically connect to anything that's got bluetooth and and you're laughing how about it yeah so so you don't need a special braille phone so yeah they're probably having even more of a great time in hanover now (laughs) with that technology advance i don't know i couldn't find any pictures of the bowling alley i don't know whether they've advanced the bowling alley at all uh i like to think they you know put neon lights in uh (laughs) Serve serve beige platters. Uh, you always need a beige platter when you go to the bowling alley, don't you? <laughs> All the best food's beige, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. One of those uh, machines that's got the Sahara nuts in it that's been sitting there for, for years. <laughs> oh, yummers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, all that stuff. The Bavarian Alps have long been a favourite German holiday resort. In the winter for skiing, of course, in the summer just for walking and climbing in the woods. But what really brings the people here is the air. They come flocking out of those smoky northern cities to flush out their lungs on this clean, sharp mountain air. But just how clean is clean? To what extent has the smoke beaten them to it, got here first? In fact, what effect are the smoking chimneys of Europe having on Europe's air? Well, nobody really knows. But now a group of West German scientists are well on the way to finding out. Because on this beautiful Bavarian Alp, they've built the world's first vertical air pollution laboratory. And the mountain itself is much more important to the project than you might at first think. It's in the right place, bang in the middle of Europe, and the right height. 10,000 feet, so that it sticks above the boundary layer of air close to the Earth. In fact, these scientists say, if it didn't exist, then they would have to build it or something like it themselves. Because, amazingly, even in these days of satellites and space travel, if you want to find out what's going on in a vertical slice of the Earth's atmosphere, there are very few ways of finding out. You can either use balloons or aircraft, but they're both expensive, transient and no good for any kind of constant monitoring. Or you can hang your instruments on a mountain if there happens to be one around. And that's what they've done here. They've built three stations. 
The first is in the valley at the foot of the mountain, and here they're picking up only local pollution, from houses and factories up to about 30 miles away. The second station is at about 6,000 feet, and here they begin to pick up pollution from much further afield. And they're measuring a range of different effects. How much of the lower pollution gets carried up into the higher levels, for example, and how much dirt is washed out of the air by rain. But it's on this top station that they're getting some of the most exciting results, because here, literally on the roof of Europe, they're into what they call the free atmosphere, and they're measuring global pollution dust and sand from the Sahara Desert and from the Russian steppes, smoke and gases from the Ruhr and the factories of Birmingham and the steel mills of Illinois, and radiation from the bomb test in Outer Mongolia. In fact, dirt from all over the world is scraped off onto this particular doorstep. All three of these research stations are virtually automatic and they're running constantly, so they're building up a minutely detailed picture of Europe's air. And apart from the fundamental weather information, they're really concerned with four main kinds of pollution. First, dust, tiny particles of dirt from dust bowls and factory chimneys all over the earth. Using very sensitive filters, they're able to pick up particles as small as 10 millionth of a centimetre across. And this is the sort of result they're getting. This filter has just come out of one of their fans. Now, it may not look very dirty, but scientifically, that's filthy. And by chemically analysing the particles on this, they can build up a picture of the chemical structure of the air. And then they're concerned with gases, particularly sulphur dioxide and nitrous oxide. The gases form whenever you burn coal and oil and wood in air. So here they're picking up the pollution from everything like oil burning power stations down to as small as your own central heating system and your car. And finally, radiation. And apart from the radioactive fallout created by man's activities on Earth, here they're picking up what might be called pollution from outer space. Radioactive substances like phosphorus-32 and sulphur-35 created by the activity of cosmic rays. Now, normally, these substances are trapped in the stratosphere. But this work has established that violent weather systems like uh, cyclones and jet stream can drag these radioactive substances down into the Earth's atmosphere. So, what does it all add up to? Well, like everything else, it seems that dirt is going up. Even at 10,000 feet, they're picking up more and more particles. And at 6,000 feet, they're beginning to detect the lead and the exhausts of thousands of tourist cars. Certainly, the mountain air will never be quite the tonic that it was, but it's not all gloomy, because they say it'll be a long, long time before the air up here is quite as thick as the stuff you're breathing now. Now, Mark, our second visit to the Alps in as many episodes, I Mark. Go figure. These, these ones, much more severe Alps than the ones that Carmen was visiting in the last episode. But it does, uh, it does raise the question, which, which art clothing would you rather go mountaineering in? A uh, early 90s power suit and jacket or a 1970s Canadian tuxedo? I, I've given this question a lot of thought, Russ, <laughs> and I'm going to have to go with the Canadian tuxedo because yeah. <laughs> I think it might be slightly warmer. You think? I think it might be slightly warmer. I mean, it yeah. must it must be fairly warm because it appears that Willy Willy scales the entire... Like, it looks like he's scaling yeah. the Matterhorn. Matterhorn, yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And the jacket <laughs> is open in a, in a, at all yeah, times. Yeah. Yeah. In, in a flimsy denim jacket and jeans. I did actually... I did think... I mean, what is the origin to the Canadian tuxedo? Well, worth looking into, I guess. I mean, this is the second time we've seen Willy Willy wear one. I don't, I yeah, don't think yeah, I looked yeah. into it last time. Turns out... Well, because it, it, it was less incongruous last time. He, he was in Vancouver. Yes, whatever. he like, was. Like, a perfectly normal place to wear <laughs> yeah. a Canadian tuxedo, as opposed to up a mountain. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Turns out that none other than Bing Crosby in 1951 was... Um, he'd been out on a hunting trip wearing a Canadian tuxedo. Because it turns out, I, I, don't, I wouldn't associate Bing Crosby with this kind of uh, clothing. Because I, mm. I, I think I only ever think of him as singing uh, Bob, 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 Bob with uh, 
uh, David Bowie. <laughs> <laughs> where that makes sense, yeah. But yeah, but back in the back in the fifties, when he was a younger man, he used to enjoy going on hunting trips, and he used to wear sort of. I've got a picture of him in 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 the sort of thing at the bottom of the of the screen there. That kind of thing. So he t- he checked in. He tried to check into the hotel Vancouver. Man behind the desk didn't recognise it as being Crosby, and said and accused him of being a bum, and said, you know, clear off. And um, luckily, one of the bellhops went. Hang on a minute. That's Bill Cro- Bing Crosby. Smoothed things over. Checked him into the you know the top suite or whatever. But word got out about this incident. Levi's heard about this, and um, so then they came up with uh, what they deemed the Canadian tuxedo for Bing Crosby. But they, but they didn't just give him a, like a jean jacket and jeans like like what we now call a Canadian tuxedo. They built that absolute monstrosity you can see at the yeah. bottom of the document there, yeah. which is this, which is a, like a hideous double breasted denim double breasted suit jacket. Yeah, <laughs> it looks absolutely horrific. Yeah, um, but the, the, obviously the, the name stuck for wearing double denim. But I'm glad that that style didn't stick. Yes, quite. <laughs> I enjoy. It's an inappropriate mix of cut and material. Yeah, it's yeah. a polite way of putting it, right? Yeah, because he looks all, he looks fine in the in the sort of the standard huge the standard peak peak lapels but, yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's he's wearing it properly though. He's, he, the 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 bottom left button is undone, <laughs> as any gentleman should have, of course. <laughs> mm, I, I reckon he could he could probably scale Everest in that as well. So <laughs> that, that get him. But yeah, so but yeah. Anyway, I thought that was interesting. But um, we've said so we've got Willy Willy climbing, scaling this mountain. There, there's a sort of a middle section where it really looks like he's on a set. I don't know whether you've. He does. Like, it is. It is no, a set. It has, no, to, be, it has to be. Real, it has to be yeah. real. Do yeah. you think the sound of the wind blowing is real? Uh, no, I do not. No, do you I think, think, I think I think a lot of yeah. No, I think that is entirely fake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Again, I could, you get close to the microphone. I could hear that. That's weird. That doesn't work. Oh, because I'm wearing... Is it because of this thing? Hang on. Take it off. Seriously. No? I can't hear Does that. Does it? Oh! That's it really maybe, the, okay. maybe it's picked up in recording, but I genuinely can't hear it. Oh, yeah, that. yeah. Okay, yeah. I think this is the least interesting... Oh segment. god! I, yeah, I can't, yeah, absolutely. Because all he does is, next. <laughs> all, he does, all he does is he goes up this mountain. Air pollution, right? And goes well. You know, this these this is recording station. It, it, this very untidy recording station. He pops into. Yeah. The only interesting thing is I noticed by the clock that it's exactly midday while he, when he goes in there. I don't know whether or midnight. What do you think? That's he waited for the scientists to go for lunch, and they go for lunch exactly. Oh they go yeah, lunch exactly at midday. So they must do. So it could be in they, German. They, so and then they snuck in. Time. Though he did say it was basically semi-autonomous, right? Like, oh, I'm not sure there's anyone's up there, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. This, this is more of a robot than any of the robots we saw. Right? <laughs> yeah, and the idea is because they're up high, they can they can record. A vertical slice. A vertical slice of, of, yeah. of, of, of the air pollution. I mean, it, it, you just point, yeah, no, there's, there's, you pointed to a load of machines. And yeah, there's and nothing to say about it. We've got readouts right? that we don't really have any understanding of yeah we know the only interesting thing in this was his outfit yeah 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 yeah, yeah. obviously i double check i couldn't find this lab um I, I tried i couldn't find any labs that were on top of bavarian mountains as far as i could tell um but uh, according to the world health organization 99 percent of the global population breathes unclean air and it causes 7 million premature deaths per year um but obviously these days we've got all sorts of equipment to mm. measure air pollution, uh, right? I mean, the, you, from the very basic strapping a test tube to a tree, which apparently is something you do. They do strap oh, okay. a test tube to a tree, or satellites. NASA's got these. You know, NASA's got this incredible uh, load of satellites called the GOES series, Geostationary Operational Environmental Satellite, and they have got so many sensors and lasers and everything mod cons on them that they can they can measure everything from outer space. They can measure whatever thing components of the atmosphere you want. And interestingly, is if you if you as long as you've got a satellite dish and the right software, anybody can access the oh, information. You just you just you, just, you can because that's the great thing about NASA. They just give away all of their all of their yeah. research for free, which I think I you know I don't think NASA's lauded for enough really, and weirdly un-American as well, isn't it? Yeah, it's true. Yeah, that's socialism. Yeah, right? yeah so it's just dangerously uh, socialistic, isn't it? So that's it, really. Satellites do it now. Uh, there there, there probably are ones up mountains, but yeah, mostly satellites, I would say. Yeah, and that's that is. As they say, we did it. Yeah. We did it, Russ. <laughs> we did it, Joe. We did it. Yeah. Shall we then? Should we? Should we tarry no further? 
Yeah, so shall we bid, okay, bid, no, we bid this episode... Auf Wiedersehen? Yes, shall we bid this episode Auf Wiedersehen, Mark? Auf Wiedersehen. Yes, we should do. Okay. Let's talk about the year in context, Russ. Cinema box office. Okay, okay. Well, as you, it's the classic seventies issue of not having any box office. So I've just got the mm. I've just got the top four biggest selling films in the UK of nineteen seventy three. Okay, go for it. And I'm going to go. I'm going to go from one to four because it's funnier. <laughs> okay. So the, the high the highest was The Sting. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. That was on TV the other day. I thoroughly enjoyed rewatching it. Second highest was Magnum Force. Mm-hmm. Third highest, the Golden Voyage of Sinbad. Okay. And fourth, the fourth biggest grossing film of 1973 in the UK was. You know, I guess what? The, the way you are smiling, is it like Confessions of a Window Cleaner or something like that? What is it? Holiday on the Buses. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Not far off. Yeah. Which is interesting because I, I, I forgot to mention it at the time, but Mr. Dr. Christopher, yeah. Dr. Christopher Wagner's assistants did look quite a lot like Olive Hoff on the bus, yeah. didn't she? What a, what a weirdly maligned character she was in, <laughs> uh, in sitcoms. Pop charts. There's some good ones in this, Mark, i got to say. Number 10, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road, Elton John, mm-hmm. your mate with the stubby fingers. Mm. Number nine, For the Good Times by Perry Como. Number eight, Talking of Canadian Tuxedos, Caroline by Status Quo. Uh, number seven, Ballroom Blitz by The Sweet. <laughs> number six, Laughing Gnome by David Bowie. It seems that I thought Laughing Gnome was a 60s song that he did. Did he really re- mm. release it? Or surely he would have been into his doing proper Bowie stuff career by now. It has to be re release, isn't it? Doesn't it? <sighs> Interesting. Number five, Monster Mash, Bobby Boris Pickett and the Crypt Kickers. <laughs> uh, Apparently there was a sequel to that song. <laughs> yeah. Number four, Nutbush City Limits, I can see in a Turner. Mm. Number three, My Friend Stan by Slade. Number two, Daydreamer Stroke Puppy Song by David Cassidy. That sounds pukey, doesn't it? <laughs> and number one, it is the Dutch national anthem, Mark. It is, of course, <gasps> Eye Level by the Simon Park Orchestra. <laughs> wow. Was known as the theme to Van der Volk. How fabulous! I was feel it. like that's been the number one before, so we must have done an episode around this time previously. <laughs> I mean, it was. I mean, it says here that it was at number one for eight weeks so far. Wow! So, so <laughs> yeah, that's incredible. I mean, okay. Not, not, only today did I hear my neighbour whistling it as he was watering <laughs> his garden. Naturally, uh, prices: gallon of petrol, thirty-nine pence; pint of beer, eighteen and a half pence. 20 figs, 26 and a half pence. Pint of milk, five and a half pence. Large loaf of bread, 11 and a half pence. Copy of the Daily Mirror, three pence. Or threepence, as I believe these pronounce it. Average house price, nine grand. Oof. Can of Coke, five and a half pence. Four Cortina, 1,075 pence. Three and a half pence. brailer phones. <laughs> uh, Golden Wonder Crisps, two and a half pence. And a pound of soft stalk margarine, 12 and a half pence. <laughs> Uh, is this before the Argos catalogue? This actually is the first ever Argos catalogue. So we would have definitely had this before. We've, we've done that. Okay. But I'll tell you Ooh. it anyway. Oh, yeah. Why not? Like like anyone remembers or cares. Go <laughs> on. <laughs> it's the Sona uh, automatic electric kettle stainless steel with teak handle. That's, that's what Ooh, draws you in. That's isn't classy, teak handle, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah, classy. I like that. Capacity three pints. Have they ever had a capacity that's not three pints? I feel like there was a two and a half pinter. No, that can't be right. Oh, no, two and a half liter. Yeah, like five, six pint. Mm. <laughs> B-E-A-B- no, I don't know. BEAB approved. Recommended retail price, £10.62, but Argos price, £7.45. <laughs> Lovely. Magazine covers? A uh, new scientist has a picture of a comet and the word comet. Can I just say, uh, digging out the Guardian again, Mark, you know there was a comet recently? Yes. Uh, they illustrated their article about that comet with a photograph of something which could could not possibly be a comet. Because the whole idea, the whole thing with a comet, right, is that it is reflecting light from the sun. Yeah, that's why we can mm-hmm. see it. Yeah. Mm. According to this fo- this photograph, they had was a dark was a dark streak of smoke against a light sky. How did that be a comet? It was like it was clearly a rocket or something. I just thought, what, 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 how have they got? What, what who, who's done that? Like, oh, Russ added to the grievance list. <laughs> 
they did they updated it a day later but the damage oh, so they actually they did so they must have had people yeah, complaining the damage right, had okay. been done mark the damage had been done it's just it, no wonder they get all their scientific content from us <laughs> <laughs> Thank, thank God we all do our due diligence. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, yeah. Scientific American, uh, the solar corona. That's the that's corona as in the the thing around the sun rather than mm-hmm. viruses. The beer. <laughs> yeah, or the beer. Popular science has phony money detectors. Time magazine. And you won't believe this, Mark. How times have changed. Oh, yeah. War in the Middle East. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 14 times. This is actually issue number one of the 14 Times. It wasn't even called the 14 oh. Times. It was called The News. I can see where they changed it. Yeah, news. it's called The News, yeah. And it's got a picture of a man on a horse blowing a trumpet. Um, you can see where they changed that. I mean, it could confuse a reader, couldn't it? Yeah. Private Eye. I think I got you this copy of Private Eye, Mark. Ooh. It's got a picture of... Uh, it's, it's Agnew and Nixon, The Last Farewell. Yeah, you did. Yes, yes I do have that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's it, in my office somewhere. It's got, and it's got uh, Spiro Agnew shaking Nixon's hand, saying goodbye, sir, and Nixon going, ah, as if uh, <laughs> yes. uh, Agnew has uh, yeah. squeezed his hand too hard. Squeezing his hand. And then Playboy uh, has a lady laying on a bed. Uh, looks like she might, probably just might have just woken up. Forgot to put a nightdress on. Sexual behaviour in the 1970s. New fiction by Gore Vidal. Gore Vidal's one of those people that I know who I know his name. I have actually no idea what he's done ever. What, he's the one who makes... Is he the one who does the shampoo or is he the war poet? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Playboy interviews NFL czar Pete Rozelle and 10 pages on bunnies of 73. Beautiful. Beautiful. Looking back, there's only five segments and they're all over long. Yep. So most important invention. Most important invention is, I guess it's got to be the phone. Ah, the background thing that he doesn't really talk yeah, about. The, yeah, the, 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 the sense of having an automated phone di- yeah. director inquiry system. Yeah, because that's the real yeah. innovation there, not the, less, not the phone words. Yeah. Yes, very good. Uh, most worthless invention. I mean, is is it is it the the rest of that segment? <laughs> <laughs> the bit he actually spends time talking to us about. I get well. Um, what about the spe- hand torture device? Specific, no, well, specifically in the case of Germany. Oh, the nuclear robots because <laughs> they don't have a nuclear industry. Oh, I see. Now, yeah, yeah, yeah. What a wa- what a waste. Um, well, which obviously gets to number three, then the most inaccurate prediction of the future. Yeah, predicting that Germany would have a nuclear industry. I thought that's supposed to have a nuclear industry for, for, for uh, a while, but, but, years but, after but this, it didn't went they? out of fashion. I feel like there was another one that you. Oh, yeah, it was. It was the idea that there would be a computer in Europe that yes. had us all, which obviously didn't happen. And not least because he said by 1984, which I never knew was like, was he being a 1984 like, reference? Like as in, yeah. as in, you know, yeah, but I doubt all, it. Oh well, yeah, on its. The computer's remorseless and infallible memory, uh, which obviously didn't happen. Uh, but I think, I think, yeah, I think I agree with you in the nuclear one there. Uh, worst screw up. Mm. He, he, he does. There's a moment where he like he mangles his words slightly when he's up the top of the mountain talking about the machinery. Mm. Is it? Um, is it the uh, whoever, whatever German uh, accidentally dropped a nuclear device off the back of the oh. lorry on the far side of the road? That, that's literally the definition of you had one job, right? <laughs> yeah. But then to drive off without bothering to, <laughs> yeah, that that seems like poor. That seems like a, a poor a poor day's work, right? Yeah. Best attempt at making something boring interesting. I made well. You... I imagine being deaf and blind would be quite boring if you didn't have loads of entertainment. I imagine they have a rich inner life. Uh, the nuclear robots make something interesting boring, so <laughs> we, have to, we can't include that one. Slim pickings, right? Willy Willy uh, being in the cafe. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I no like the cafe. Yeah, yeah. I think, that, I think that's it, because that is completely di- disconnected from the rest of the segment, which then the second he moves to the actual office becomes deathly boring. <laughs> I, I think that was it. I was trying to remember what it was. He said, "Oh, we'll talk about that later." And yeah, it was that. Yeah. It was it was the um the 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 the, the starting shot in the cafe. Best use of music. Well, There's only so really one, right? Kleiner Nacht music. Yeah. There was there was a bit of zither music, but it they dropped that quickly. Whereas yeah. Einen, Einen Kleiner Nacht music is is kind of intrinsic to the piece. Yes. Best or worst use of furniture. Is, um, that, is that Dr. Christoph Wagner's everything? To- well, I was thinking. I, I think in. Do he, yeah, do his torture devices count as furniture? Or what I was thinking was, it, what about the vibrating handrail that helps, oh. helps the helps the deaf blind people? Does that count as furniture? Is that, is that, is that is a handrail that, is furniture? Handrail furniture. 
is handrail furniture. If I was thinking about stairs, would I call the banisters and balustrade part of the fr- stair furniture? <laughs> Stair French. I mean, now that you've invented that phrase, it does sound convincing. <laughs> Have I invented that phrase? <laughs> I don't know, but I don't think I've heard it before. I've heard of street furniture. Oh, maybe that's what I'm thinking. Relate, maybe I think of street relating furniture. Relating to signage. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> as, as, as opposed to stair furniture. I'm going to go with no, but I am going to say that I think Dr. Christopher Wagner's torture devices are furniture because right. he basically straps people to the chairs by yeah. their hands. Yeah, yeah, all right. Yeah. yeah. yeah most notable clothing I mean, well a, i mean it's a no-brainer isn't it mark I mean, absolutely he's, he's impeccably dressed throughout the episode i'll really worry yes great, yes great yes. shirt and tie combo at the beginning but but yeah, yeah. that say canadian tuxedo absolutely smashes it out of the park yeah chef's kiss right yeah. did we see in the end the episode that made it through to the future well i mean starting from the country down yeah lots didn't <laughs> I, th- I think a low-level British resentment of German success yeah. has made it into the future. Do you <laughs> yeah, think? yeah, 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 yeah. 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 I mean, yeah, gaslighting well. has made it into the future. <laughs> it's never been so popular. We, de- we definitely have nu- not the same nuclear robots. We do do. We no, do yeah. have nuclear robots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Uh, we do. Th- th- we do have automated directory inquiries. Yeah. We, the Jeff Deafblind Association is going better than ever. Going. Yeah. Uh, and air pollution and we, and we do we have plenty of air pollution so you know so and quite a lot does make it through yeah. yeah what does this episode tell us about the 18th of october 1973 uh still to the li- to the losers the spoils that's what it says <laughs> yeah. to me yeah absolutely it's it's well it's well worth yeah well worth starting a war and, and losing it losing yeah. it yeah them. twice yeah it, it does take a second time for it all to click well no no but i mean the japanese got to have it all right as oh, well that's didn't true. they yeah, they're, yeah, they're, they're, yeah they're laughing aren't yeah. they <laughs> But what is it t- and, and, and tell us? <laughs> funnily enough, I, I feel like this episode tells us more about Britain than some of the episodes <laughs> that we've seen from this time that are ostensibly about British yeah. innovation. Yeah, um, I don't. I don't think things are going great, Russ. No, no. At least, it, at least, there's no direct comparison. All the comparisons are no are subtext. Like subtext, aren't they? Yeah. Yes. And but oh, and also, obviously, Munich is uh, very Bavarian. Yes, still is yes. delightfully the, so. The seventies. You know, because some places, the the 70s really took off in such a way that I think we've seen in some previous episodes, everyone's walking around in uh, oh, yeah. uh, huge collars uh, yeah. and, and, and flares and, and all of this monarchy. Everyone in Munich is, they're, they're, not, they're not wearing flared laser hosen or... Uh, <laughs> no, that's true. <laughs> yeah. Like that. they're, they're, they're sticking with their traditions. Which is to so, be respected. Yes. Yeah. 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 Not, not every German tradition needs to be stuck to, but some, <laughs> some absolutely do. <laughs> Fabulous. Uh, it does look like a very happy, fun place, though. Mm. All right, let's look at our, our Tomorrow's World tropes then. So uh, did we, at any point did we have a presenter having to speak over loudest sounds? No, the loudest was when um, Willy Willy was trying to talk over the sound of the wind whistling through mm. the Alps, but it wasn't particularly loud. No, or indeed the mechanical clock in the town mm. hall, but again, it wasn't particularly loud, so I think it was a no. Suspiciously obvious brand name in the ad-free BBC? Siemens. Well, I think I saw Siemens all over the place. Yeah, Willy, I? Willy Willy got Siemens all over his phone. <laughs> oh, well done, Russell. <laughs> Clear and blatant lying. Just thought of that as well. I was going to do that. Um, <laughs> Clear and blatant lying. Um, Can't think of anything egregious. There's the stuff that, it, that didn't turn out to be the case, but there's nothing like, there's no lying. No, I don't think so. No. Uh, no evil farmers, sadly. I think there was a bit of casual sexism. I, mean, th- I think there's on, on several occasions, which a lot of episodes in this time often with willy woolly in charge <laughs> refer to skilled people uh, uh, in the masculine it's always men who you know so that robot operators only a few men can do it I, su- I suspect more than a few men can do it and i suspect some women can probably also do it yeah. as well and there's a few little litterings of like the, uh, 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 you know uh, of that i think laying around so I- i'm gonna go with yes clear uh, casual sexism rather no dutch angle i don't think there's a dutch angle no there were some slightly funny angles on the on the mountain but that, i think that's actually out of necessity rather than uh artistic yes artistic, now uh, here's brain. one where i'm willing to have a debate item presented from a gantry or would you consider the the up the mountain mountain path uh, yeah i mean gantry esque I, th- I think there were gantry esque parts of that yeah. uh, ladder yeah. that rickety, lick- rickety ladder he was going yeah. up or yeah. lick- rickety stairway so I'm, i i think that's a yes yeah. for me even though it's not quite what we meant uh episode ends on a, ends on a damp squib um yeah i mean it's the worst it's yeah. the worst segment of the, of yeah. the program uh woolard or mccann abroad or common in a small european town i think we can say yes to that there were no lasers no there were no magnets no there were boats, there were boats yeah 
they were about it because that's how they get the coal down the Danube, was it? The Rhine, and they didn't travel to Shepherd's Bush. Mm, so yeah. not not a great success rate. No, but, but these specials, you know, these specials really are always, always that's a bit true. special, aren't they? They are always a bit special, yeah. That's it then. That That's a very, very low level number of tropes for that one. But as you say, it is a special episode. Speaking of which, that was uh, the 45th episode we've covered of only 1,409, Russ, which means that we have a paltry 1,364 left to go. <laughs> I'm just hoping that Willy Wooler can understand that sequence of numbers I've just put there because <laughs> it's not my normal pattern. <laughs> can you convert that? Let's see if we convert that into letters. Hang on. That would be oh. uh, two... two <laughs> wow, you're so quick. <laughs> hang on, 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 hang on. That would be. Oh no, hang on. One. Oh, we can't yeah, even one do it. Count. One doesn't count. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. <sighs> can't even do it, Mark. Oh well. That would be listen to voicemail. <laughs> D O G dog. There we go. That's the best I can do. <laughs> listen to voicemail dog. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's what it is. Listen wow. to voicemail dog. I don't think a dog would understand voicemail, Mark. It makes no sense. I no, see, it makes no I, sense, I, I Russ. I see what Willy Willy means now. <laughs> anyway, got to go now, Mark, because for you, this podcast is over. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, what a relief. I think we've done quite well without incorporating any offensive German stereotypes into this episode, really, considering all... all yeah, all, it was all, there, all though. Speak, speak at the subtext. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, it's lo- well, lovely, to, lovely to speak to you on this very special episode. I'm sure we'll be back again soon. Very, uh, very soon. Should we try and get two episodes? Should we get, try and episode, another episode I, in and then a Christmas episode? I thought as a minimum we could definitely do one and then Christmas. Yeah. We might be able to squeeze two and then Ooh. Christmas, yeah. That's, that's the Possibly. sort of hard-working German attitude I like to hear, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> yep. But anyway, yes, yeah, so... That's it from us. Oh, oh, by the way, but, don't hold us to that. No, no, yeah, God, no. Don't do that, no. <laughs> You'd be lucky if you get one. Yeah. Yeah, nice to speak to you and... Pleasure. It's all the same from me Ooh. and all the same from you. And if you are on the internet, we will see you tomorrow. Goodbye. <laughs>